the Thinking Tackle podcast. Welcome to the Thinking Tackle podcast. Joining me today in the studio is Danny Fairbrass and Thrive Programme Coach Rob Kelly. Now, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, is an anxiety disorder caused by frightening or distressing events. I'm sure some of you would even know someone who suffered from it, or maybe you've experienced it for yourselves. So on the show today, we're going to discuss the subject in detail, hopefully bringing awareness to the condition and sharing methods for dealing with it. Danny Fairbrass, Rob Kelly, uh, the Thrive, the Thrive Programme Coach, welcome to the podcast again. Thank you very much. Delighted to be here. Cheers, mate. Thank you Good. very much. Well, after last week's um, podcast, a couple of weeks ago, um, you got quite a lot of uh, comments after that one, Dan. I have to say that the response has been, is it literally has moved me to tears. I've had so many people, um, only yesterday, Daryl Peck, of all people, I got a photograph through on WhatsApp, and it was the Thrive Manual and a, and a bottle of Factor 50. Really? No words. Perfect. Nothing. Mm, That's what I got, because he actually listened to it. You know, right. and he's the last person I thought would have mm. been up for some self development and what have you. But clearly, he's got things that he wants to deal with. Um, and we talked about what coach. I've got to ask you actually about what coach would be best for Daryl because he's a bit of a geezer, isn't he? Bit of a, bit of a geezer. He's, he's, he, he is. He is. He is the goat, the greatest of all time. He is the greatest angler of all time as it stands at the moment. And I'll argue that with anybody. Um, he may not have been as iconic because he's still around now and he's not a legend from the 60s or the 70s. Right. But when it comes to achievement, he is the greatest of all. He's caught everything. It's that, that guy there. That's him as a young man. And he went to that lake, which if you can't name every mirror carp in that lake, you're not allowed to fish there. That's the unwritten rule. <laughs> right. right. There That's, aren't too it, many. It, but... it is, there's only nine of them. Well, wasn't there? Was there nine? Yeah, nine, yeah. Um, yeah. And I never fished there because I thought there's no way I'm going on there. That is that is big boy stuff. And I, you know, yeah. and he went on there and fished his own way. They all used bait boats, a little remote control boat to take your thing out. And he just fished his way, casting from the bank using great big baits where everyone was using tiny little ones. And he caught them all. Wow. And, and when, just, you, when you meet Daryl, yeah. But, but he went on to the next place and caught the record, didn't he? Went on to the place <laughs> that had the record in, yeah. caught that. Everywhere he goes, he just catches them. Um, but he's, I'm sure... It, Daryl's because he's grown up alone lost his I think he lost his dad when he was quite young um, he's obviously he's grown up very independent um, and Daryl he's a sole trader he does his own thing you know because he's never never been a team player had to be a team player and, yeah. but that serves you as an angler so well and uh, you know for him that was such a compliment and we had a great conversation he said Dan I'm really sorry about that shoot in in Germany last year, he said, "If we'd known, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have like, because he he basically started his own business with one of my key members of staff, and I was really upset about it. And I went, mate, you don't have to apologise. If you'd known, I was waiting to find out if I had bowel cancer, and then you did it, then you'd have something to apologise for. But yeah. you didn't know, did you? He went, no. I said, so don't apologise, mate. Nothing. And I said, the only reason I didn't have the hunt with you, I was disappointed that we'd gone to a lake where I didn't know you could only use two rods." When we all we all use three okay. as we've been talking about. I didn't know you could only use two rods. I didn't the, the airport that was right opposite that you would take off and land in. They said there's a couple of light aircraft. They took off at nine o'clock in the morning and it was all day until six o'clock in the evening. So you can't do any filming for the entire day. And the bloke hadn't told us. And we'd driven all the way to northern Germany. And then he said, yeah, there's a, an out of bounds area that's full of trees underwater and you can't fish in there. That's where the fish are going to live. Yep. So it's it might be my last ever masterclass, catastrophizing the situation <laughs> and blowing it out of proportion. But I thought this could be my last ever masterclass, and it isn't what it's being cracked up to be. And that was why I was withdrawn and a bit touchy, and I wasn't my normal self because I'm thinking this is my last ever one, and or it could be. Right, and I'm and sure. and, yeah. and the situation. But to get that from Daryl. Did, did, did Daryl get into why he bought the book then? I mean, did no, we didn't. We didn't get into, but he's mad keen to do it again. Daryl, he plays his cards very close to his yeah, chest. He's, yeah. you know, his his sort of way of coping with things is to internalise it. You know, he's not doesn't. He's the opposite of wearing your heart on your sleeve, yeah, Daryl, isn't yeah, he? He yeah. really is. You know, but we fish together as a pair, and we fish together brilliantly. We bounce off each other. He's all. I always say. 
you know, Daryl's basically running at 100 miles an hour, and I'm behind him going, Daryl, Daryl, wait for me. Wait, can you, because he's so good, you know. So, so, all that time you spent with him, have you ever seen any any weaknesses like that, or, you know, um, da- lack of self confidence? Well, no, not lack of self confidence, but I would say Daryl's, like most of us, his greatest strength is also his greatest weakness. So, that single mindedness and that. I'm going to use this approach and nothing else. That confidence in his ability stops him from being open-minded enough to take on other ways of doing it. Mm. So he'll do it and do it and do it and fail rather than listen to somebody else and maybe take something. Mm. Whereas I'm just looking at him the whole time thinking, if he's catching more than me, he's doing it better than Mm. me. So I need to take, take a bit of what he does. So my in the past lack of confidence in my own abilities actually was a strength and a weakness just the same as his inability to take something else on you know and that has cost him in that we did a shoot last year we did two shoots one it was his style of fishing and he fished outside the box and he was amazing and the next one i told him i'd fished the lake a lot before he hadn't i told him exactly how i thought it was going to be it worked out exactly like that and he had an absolute mare and i smashed the living daylights out of it you know and Hopefully, he will look back on that and think, do you know what, I should have actually listened to Dan and... It's interesting, it. isn't it? So, you know. actually, the two of you are looking at each other, aren't you? And uh, it's not you just looking at Daryl, is it? He's looking at you for I other think, purposes I think, as well. Well, obviously, he's, he's watched the podcast and that has inspired him. Yeah. You know, that has inspired him. And that's a that's a big, the biggest compliment anyone can give you, isn't it? But Yeah, someone like that, Rob. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. If you know him, you know, he's he's a very guarded character. You know, he's just yeah. that's the way he's grown up. But, um, but no, I've had... I've had wives of blokes that I don't, I know sort of, there might be Spooner's friend or whatever, and send me a WhatsApp message that's that long. Thank you so much. I'm so inspired. I just want to tell you how amazing the podcast was. I've sat all my kids down and watched it. None of them would wear lotion. Now they all put it on before they go out to play football every single time, and I don't have to say a word. You know, that that's that, like Damien's Mrs. Wendy said, I know you're getting probably getting loads of messages, but I had to write and tell you this. Francesca, which is Damien's oldest uh, with Wendy, um, would not put lotion on. We have the battle every year, and Wendy said, I win the battle, but we still have a battle, because <laughs> yeah, Wendy, yeah, she Wendy does not lose, <laughs> no, does she? Not at all. In life, <laughs> Wendy does not lose. Um, and, um, she, and she said, but I sat, sat down and made her watch it, and now she just puts lotion on, and she runs for the lotion first. And she never goes. They've got a beautiful house, haven't they? With yeah, loads yeah, of lovely. loads of grounds and that. She never goes out of it. And I said to Wend, and I really mean this: if I just got that out of it, if we just got yeah. that, it would have been enough. We, we've had more messages than normal, Tove, as we've well, had, haven't we? We've it, had loads, loads of messages. I've even I've even had messages personally myself yeah. from friends and stuff that have watched it. Dan, I told you didn't I? We had a phone call the day um, not long after. My friend, we were fishing and. Um, he shouted to me from the other peg along, have you put some suntan lotion on? Mm. And I was like, I wasn't having a good day. I said, yeah, 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 I'll do it in a minute, I'll do it in a minute, I'll do it in a minute. Mm. And I was just staying there, like waiting for the rod to go round. And all of a sudden, I felt this hand slap on the back of my neck and rubbing it in. And he went, don't be a prick. <laughs> <laughs> I went, yeah, fair play. There you go. Hashtag really that. Perfect. Yeah. Yep. Perfect. Yeah, we've had yeah, like I say, we've we've had all sorts of people. We've had, we've I've spoke to Cancer Research today actually. Right. Um, one of our um, one of the guys on Instagram, a bit out of carp, a, a, a bit a bit out of cancer. The Instagram page is called, and uh, you know he's he's been talking to us and uh, speaking to Cancer Research. They kind of want to work in tandem with us. They've watched the podcast. Brilliant. It's uh, a father saying that. They feel that they need to do this now because put, using sunscreen as an example to their kids. Yeah. You know, it's just um, never seen a response like that. No, no, me neither. It's just, you know, I had quite a lot of, um, are you all right? I'm like, just watch the podcast, mate. Just, just watch it. Just yeah. watch it, yeah. you know, yeah. all, all of that sort of stuff, which they have done and come back to me. A lot of my mates I haven't heard a thing from that have dedicated anglers. And I'm like, fair play, boys. You've just watched it, got what you got. You know, you've not felt the need to ring me up and check that I'm still alive, you know. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but yeah, just that, you know, one of the funniest bits, I was up at Norton Disney last week because I, I, I had my tu- second tube out on Thursday morning. That's the difference um, from last week, the last time you came from on. From last it? time, I had both tubes in then mm. um, and uh, they took one out a week or so later and it's, it's real to do with how much you drain, how much fluid's coming out. And um, uh, yeah, the second one out last Thursday morning at London Bridge, 8.30 a.m., 
Um, I was at Norton Disney by two o'clock in the afternoon and I bay lift at Norton Disney for a couple of days and helped out up there, which was amazing because it's our lakes complex up okay. near Lincoln. And over the last six months, it's been shut completely and we're losing two or three grand a day to be shut. And they've basically drained every lake down almost dry, taken all the trees out, every stick, every rock, everything that you could get snagged on, taken them all out and filled it back up again. Like mammoth, nobody else would have done that on earth would have done that. So to see it now all grown up and all lush and full of anglers and the bloke went to me, this, this, <laughs> this, this, this geezer, his, his missus works for Saatchi and Saatchi, he'll okay. know who I'm talking about. And uh, scat, uh, well, Scouser from the Weir or something like that, you know, got, got the full on accent, he wait. He went, mate, the funniest bit in that thing was when you talked about Rob getting his bum licked. He said, and his, his mum went to him, that's not a thing, is it? And he went, it is, mum, it is a thing. And she was like, really? Like, and it's all like, all them, we're all just absolutely pissing ourselves laughing. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's like, you know, it's just, um, it's that, that, you know, I think everyone's just really taken in by the transparency of it all and the, you know the honesty of it all and all that sort of thing and uh it's funny like julie downstairs who's an absolute firecracker just a force of nature she went can i give you a hug and i'm like you absolutely can so i hugged her downstairs in the canteen and i went ah, ah, ah. <laughs> and everyone else oh, like everyone started laughing she was like oh you know um Bit of yeah it just yeah it's just it's been you know and obviously for me and I'm sure you get this all the time as well, but to know you've made that much difference to people, you just walk around with this with this lovely, warm feeling inside you. And I honestly don't think it will ever go in me now, um, having got the messages that I've got, you know. Um, and, uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful thing, and I hope it just carries on doing good. Yeah, and we can see, hopefully we can see some changes as well with, um, you know. We will. I mean, y- y- Jens, who's one of our guys that used to work for us in in um, Europe uh, one of our German salesmen who's gone back into the pharmaceutical industry has got a really good connection with Nivea um, and he's approaching Nivea about them making the lotion for us so not us co-selling it making factor 50 for That's us really good idea. and and the wipes <laughs> and Nivea are a fairly big firm, aren't they? Just a bit. Do, do, you, know, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, <laughs> so if if that comes about and because he's got an in with them, he sells pharmaceuticals to Nivea to use you never know it might happen yeah. but but yeah and other people I know work in the, my mate Rusty his missus works in the skincare industry and that she's actually said that and and Aris said it here as well that that P20 that I brought in P20's been banned in Australia I don't know if you knew that yeah I did read the article on that yeah Why it's just so that? because it? I think it's this one application yeah. that is not actually safe one application I don't think it's the they're saying one application because they sell it as one application yeah. don't they and it, yeah. it's so it's not, not that it, it doesn't work oh it works but it doesn't stay yeah. for the whole day mm. so you know but I mean it's still great stuff and if you have to put it on twice I mean I do when it's really hot and I'm on holiday I reapply it when I get out of the pool and I've dried off later on in the afternoon I put it on again but um but uh, yeah, and they're talking about this, the skincare industry are talking about trying to ban it in the UK or in the whole of Europe as well for that same reason, mm. you know. So people just be aware of that, that it is great stuff, but you have got to reapply, mm. you know. Yeah. Do you find in this country, sorry, did you want to say something there, Rob? No, I was just thinking about the whole thing about why, why do you think people generally are reluctant to use sun cream? It's, it's, you- not, it's not manly. It's not masculine. When I grew up, like blokes did not put suntan lotion on. That was for girls. And I think it's can't be bothered as well. And and also in angling, because you go out on the bank and you don't have a shower for three days. You fish for three days a night. Everyone goes, what do you do? Where do you go to the toilet and all that? And, and you don't tell them exactly what you end up, you're crap in a bucket and all that sort of thing. And you don't, you might get a wet wipe and have a go over, but but you don't all you want to do is fish you know so if you've put something oily on and that's got dirty grimy and then you have to get in a sleeping bag and then you get up the next morning and it's grimy still and then you've got to put it on again it's it's not like being on holiday where you jump in the pool where you go have a shower when you get out yeah. of, you know so that's where that p20 the the uh, alcohol one is good because it's not greasy at exactly all. that's yeah. what we want what you clean your teeth yeah if you if you're staying away for three days, yeah. you clean your teeth. Yeah, I've got a I've got a, a battery powered electric toothbrush. So you clean your teeth, and but, a floss. but previously you wouldn't have put sun cream on. Yeah. So there is a link here. This is the thing I thought there is a link that people generally feel so powerless about cancer 
they don't think there is anything they can do. That's why cancer is one of the questions in our quiz, right? Generally speaking, because of the way a lot of the cancer charities have uh, uh, advertised for support, a lot of people feel just powerless about it, right? Yeah. They feel that cancer, you know, uh, in fact, one of the videos from a couple of years ago was like a, a ghoul in this room behind, who's it, is it gonna, is it gonna be Simon? Is it gonna jump on you next? You know, it's so unpredictable, there's nothing you can do about it, which you know now is not the truth. Yeah. Yes, of course, there are types of cancer which anyone can get, but actually it's fairly predictable the things you can do to prevent it. Yes, so skin by, cancer, yeah, yeah, definitely. So by, by, by doing that, you, you are getting people to change from feeling powerless to powerful, and that's why that's messes. So the interesting thing is, and we, part of the conversation we had on the van on the way over, I bet you will find just that one change of doing that one thing differently is going to have positive repercussions in the rest of their lives, right? Because now they're feeling powerful in one small area mm. around skin cancer, right, and sunlight. You will find people will start to tell you stories about their kids. Oh, yeah, suddenly he started doing his own shoelaces up suddenly he started cleaning his football doing his bits. homework doing when, his, his when homework he's supposed more. to they're feeling me him. more powerful and I'm hogging the mic a sec no no no, no we, want, we want you to hog the mic so, so there was this big study I may have touched on it before and, and it, it was about the old age pensioners and the old age people's home right and they found that um, a horrible statistic but about a third of OAPs die within the first year of going into an old age people's home in the UK obviously they're old anyway but they kind of give up the will to live Okay, this study found that if you gave them a pot plant to look after and nurture and talk to and feed, they lived for up to thirty percent longer. Mm. The, the OAPs, that is not the plants, right? Thirty <laughs> percent longer. Okay, and the reason was because they felt more powerful from doing that one small thing. Okay, that they felt powerful in other areas of their life, right? So they started eating better. They started doing more exercise. They started getting actively involved in whatever OAPs do for sports. Yeah. So one small, powerful thing can have massive repercussions in other areas of your life. Yeah, and I think, mad, I think that's going to be the surprise to you guys in another month or two when people start saying, oh, it's funny, yeah, it used to be pain getting him to school and now he just goes in easily. It used to be difficult getting him to socialise. He, he would sit at the back at Cubs, now he goes talking to people. You'll find that. In so the, feeling uh, powerful is like feeling personal, personally responsible. Yeah, feeling you've got a skill you. set. It's up to you, well, it's not, not just, It's else. not just that it's up to you, because there are lots of things that are up to you, but you still don't do anything. I mean, it was always up to you to wear sun care, right? But you never did. It's up to you and you feel able to. Yeah, it's right, like we're okay. saying in the book with external beliefs, isn't yeah. it? You know, you, you're, you're taking back that control. You've got an yeah. internal belief back in yourself to be able to do that. There's something, we were talking about weight, weren't we? So there's, a, there's somewhere in 13 or 14 million adults in the UK that are supposed to be clinically obese. And uh, as we talked about last time, you know, weight in that respect is quite a simple thing it's calories in calories out right yeah there are other permutations of it that's essentially it right eat less exercise more so why are there 13 million obese people in the uk because every time you go on a diet and fail you feel less powerful now it may well be that right now there's an amazing diet which is incredibly easy to follow that all of these people would lose weight and feel more healthy right but because they feel so powerless you're going to tell them oh fantastic they're going to go, yeah yeah whatever dan because they feel so powerless. It's mm. not that healthy eating rather than diets don't work. It's that people feel so powerless because they tried so many things before and that didn't work. They have no hope left. They have no, no belief left that it would work. What you've done this last week, you've given people a massive kick up the arse so that they kind of believe again. They believed you. Some of the text messages we got, you know, from people that you perhaps don't even know that contacted us, you know, two or three of them said, I believe Danny. If, da if Danny says it, I believe Danny. Good. Which is what you that's wanted, yeah? yeah? Absolutely, because it's trust, isn't it? It's yeah. trust. Yeah. yeah. You know, if and Danny that's says the, it. Yeah. That's the most important thing for me that people trust me and they believe me. You Do know? you find that as a therapist as well, Rob? That it's, it's that trust that people are putting into you as well. I mean, it's important that the therapist can get that trust from the client. Hundred percent, and, and that's another reason why a lot of uh, therapies and interventions don't work. Because if you haven't got belief in them, you don't put any effort in. So a massive part of the Thrive Programme, as you know, is instilling that belief early on. That's why we put all the research into it. So, uh, you know, I'm like, you know, people say, oh, you know, I said, D don't believe me. 
read the fucking research read the data read yeah. the reports yeah. read it yourself you come to a conclusion i'm, I'm yeah. confident you'll come to the same conclusion as me right yeah but if you re if you read the research but also papers, the little excerpts that come from those things yeah. the bits that matter you know like when i used to obsess about the melanoma coming back i'd read um the thing on, on the, the consequence on, of dysphoric on, rumination on the on the obsessive thinking style and you know whatever research said that that it had had no positive impact excessive rumination had no positive impact on the person's circumstances and you think well this is a me this is like a psychological study that's giving all the evidence to say it's complete rubbish so just stop doing it you div you know i know no matter to go to sleep and that's it, it, essentially what it said it, it was the biggest most cited study we could ever found on depression right and it was called the consequences of dysphoric rumination which basically means what are the consequences of brooding and brooding about stuff you feel powerless about and the answer is you feel shit you feel less powerful you bring on a host of negative consequences it says essentially it does absolutely nothing the opposite makes you work. the absolute opposite of what you're trying to achieve yeah. by thinking about it you know? And the worst thing nowadays is, well, I guess it's social media as well, isn't it? Because when somebody's sick or they, they, they will, you know, they will keep procrastinating. There's and, a million groups you can go on to tell you how terrible your life is and, and how we totally understand that you feel rubbish and all that. Well, that doesn't make you feel better, does it? It keeps you feeling rubbish, Yeah, you know? Yeah. It's the same as sympathy. It's the same thing, isn't it? You know? Yeah. It really is. And um, I, I've been really pleased how I've been able to bat that away with people uh, and and just say it isn't about that mate and just get just immediately move them on to something positive and something helpful so can you, you know uh, you, uh, i did ask you this last time right but can you say how you would feel if someone i said oh dan you know sorry to hear about that how you know how are you now mate in, in, in terms of how powerful you feel have you had 10 people a day patting you on the back and asking you all right what's that going to do to you i think it would bring you down yeah, you know, it would it would just heighten the fact that you're in a crappy situation. That's why I didn't want to, I didn't want to tell anybody. Mm. That's why, and and I did. Obviously, I deliberated over coming clean about it, and I got to the point. I thought I don't care what people think about me. I really, really do not care. All I want to do is raise awareness to, to save people, to save people's lives, help people. Whatever just you want to, to spin do that around, right? though, I mean, do you have to be mindful about how you do react back to other people? Because if they ask you and it's a little bit dismissive back, I mean, that can have a, an effect on the other it person can, as well. But, but you can't be responsible for how, for how they're going to react, can you? For mm. their thoughts and feelings. You can't be responsible for that. If somebody reacts that way and they, expl and they say, you've made me feel like this like this i'm like mate, i haven't made you feel like anything you've reacted like that you know what what's happening you know because i'm fine yeah you know? i'm, I'm normal cancer yeah exactly yeah exactly. I, should, I should have precedent <laughs> yeah, in, yeah. In this, yeah, yeah. 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 Right? oh i'm yeah. sorry i upset you <laughs> yeah sorry yeah. 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 Been <laughs> said any better. sorry mate i'm the one that's ill <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. You relax. I'll, yeah. Die, I'll die quietly in the corner if that's all right with you <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah so um, but you know, but, but you would be repeatedly reminded. I mean, I think what came across last week. Okay, I don't think you made it sound easy, right? But you did it very well. And I think what people don't realise is it takes effort to keep your head above water, doesn't it? When you're going through yeah. that stuff, you've yeah, done it yeah. brilliantly, and you're doing it brilliantly, and you're you're not only keeping your head above water, but you're surfing. Yes, I am certain. On, on the Absolutely. crest of the wave. Yes. But it does take effort, doesn't it? Absolutely. It, it takes effort to keep your head positive and, and hopeful. Yeah, because everybody you else. speak to to give you sympathy is trying to bring you down. Yeah. Yep. They are, and you've got a battle against that. Yep. And obviously that's happened to me. You know, when we put the first trailer out, I rung straight up and said, what have you done? You've put the most sensationalised trailer out. My phone is just blowing up with all my mates. Are you going to die? Yeah. You know, you should have put that bit that I don't want sympathy. And then we got the trailer remade with I don't want sympathy. And it calmed down a bit, not loads. But now everyone's seen it. My phone's back to normal. How did you know it's a response on that tape? It was it it, it, it turned was, it flipped around a bit quick, didn't it? Yeah, it was it was from our end. It was incredible just to see everybody's response. Um, I just want to come back five seconds, Dan. Just yep. to, I want to touch on when you were saying, um, or more what Rob was saying about what it takes to keep above water. I had a friend of mine again who I stayed with in Liverpool. Couldn't believe he, he was. He thought it was brilliant the fact that he'd seen your show. And then yesterday you did some work on um, was it Instagram stories you, when you were down at Norton and you were yeah. having banter on the camera. Yeah. And he was like, 
that's brilliant. He thought it was epic that you were just having a laugh, like it was nothing. Yeah, we, we had people at Norton like come up to us and said, "Um, oh, my mate rang me. He said, come down." He went, "Danny Fairbrass is here." Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. I'm people like, don't believe it. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And I, I and he's he's not even fishing. I was like, I was bivvied up behind Lance, who works for us at Embryo, just to punish Lance. You know, and he properly, you know, he, he's going through Thrive at the moment, right. Lance is. And he properly, you know, he's concerned about how thing, how he comes across all the time. And he comes across brilliant, you know, yet he's still got these concerns. So I bivvied up behind him on purpose. So my tent's back from the water's edge and his is in front of me. Um, so, all, and, and I just happened to be in the busiest junction of the whole complex. So every car had to come past me. So they've come past this bivvy that's nowhere near the water. And you can see them, they like look in and then the... <laughs> Like that, and they reverse back. Hello, Dan, you all right, mate? Yeah, I'm good, mate. Where, where you pick it? What swim are you going in, and all that sort of thing? Yeah, lovely, mate. I'll right, see you later. You know, and it would you could see they would just they couldn't believe it. Absolutely That's couldn't it. believe and, it. And did you notice their response to you as well after you know after the show that went out the previous week? They they got the message that you you were oh, yeah, just there mate. as a bailiff and yeah, uh, Matt, yeah, they um yeah definitely. I no one fussing over me. All just said, mate, it's brilliant. You know. um uh, or said nothing at all, yeah. you know. So it, yeah. was, it was really good. Really, yeah. and often it's so easy on your phone or social media, media to be overly kind or overly caring or overly horrible, isn't it? Because it's faceless, isn't yeah, it's it? Easy, yeah. It's like getting road rage, isn't it? You're in your car, they're in their car. You haven't actually got to fight them. You can just give it all that in the car and then and then drive off, can't you? And the same with social media. You can be in an extreme version of what you would actually be like face to face. Like no one's ever come up to me at a show and given me a load of verbal and said that product shit that's failed on me. Da da da. I can remember one bloke saying to me, "Your supernatural's rubbish." It was snapping in the middle. I went, "Well, show me," and I tied it up for him. And he went <coughs> like that really fast. I said, "Mate, a fish never picks it up." and goes against a dead weight like that, that fast. I said, they pick the bait up and the line starts to move. He said, well, it snapped in the edge on me on a big fish. I said, well, you didn't use a heavy enough one then, did you? You should have used the 25, not the 18, yeah. you know? Yeah. And he's the only bloke. I'm fair play to him. And I solved his problem and his dad went, he's always like this. Just leave <laughs> right, and, 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 and off he went. But nobody else, the amount of people that have slagged me off on social media, no one else has come up to him and said, I think you're a prick. Mm. You know, well, they, they know you're going to be. People, they, they, they haven't got the front, have they? There's a, there's a queue of people out the front yeah. just now. Right? <laughs> well, there, yeah. <laughs> Rob, um, last year it was, it was this time last year we done a we done a podcast with Dr. Mark Wheeler, who um, is a clinical psychologist, PhD, and uh, his company iCarp. Um, it's about helping ex vets um, overcome PTSD, okay. and he, he's running a scheme. I don't know if you've heard about yeah, this I have or not. Um, so. Maybe we should talk about PTSD in, in, in fishing in general because talking to, to Mark, we know how successful fishing can be in relation to uh, PTSD. So we have to take a, a tiny step back again, first of all. And we talked last week about mental health being a continuum, right? It's a line that starts at zero, ends at, say, 10. And everybody is on that line, right? Clinically depressed people are down here. You know, people that are suicidal are down here. People, zero, uh, uh, zero, or just one, two, you yeah. know, somewhere around there. Mm. People are absolutely thrive. So Danny's around an eight, a nine, or a ten at the ten. moment, right? Ten. There ten. you go. Okay. <laughs> Can't go any yeah. further, right? Yeah. And all of us, every other person, is on that same continuum. Okay, where they are on it is basically about how well they're managing a skill set to thrive. Okay, you know, Danny to live had, life to the full. To live life to the full. Is another way and, of and, it. and to make well to make the right choices and and the right thinking in response to the stresses and pressures of life in order to get the most out of it. You know, life isn't great for Danny at the moment, but he's having a great life at the moment. Which True. is why people couldn't figure out why you're up at... Norton. Norton yeah, last yeah. week, yeah. Yeah, yeah. a few yeah. days ago, smiling mm. and joking. Hang on a sec, I thought he was dying of cancer. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So people don't understand that you can have... You don't have to have your emotions dictated to you by your environment and everything else that's going on, right? So that's the first thing. So, so mental health is a continuum. Where you are on that continuum is pretty much related to how well you manage your mental health skill set. And it really is, I, I wouldn't say it's a simple skill set, but it's quite a basic skill set that you know anybody can learn. Which we don't, we don't get any training on. No, nothing. Well, I didn't when I left school and in my life generally. I've done self-development all my life because I've wanted to be a better person. Um, but you just don't, do you? There's you nothing. Don't, you don't. 
Oh, it should be. This should be taught in schools. Yeah. You know, and what and what the, and what there is actually pretty much detracts from it. So that 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 we've well, got that in mind now. So you've got this continuum, and it's a perfectly teachable, learnable skill. I just did a podcast about ten days ago. I'll give you a link to it. This lady called Mary. Mary's eighty that, yeah. eighty-seven, right? She was m- mostly housebound all of her life. She had this major phobia that the Thrive Program helps with called emetophobia. Uh, um, completely changed her life. That's the fear of being sick. Fear isn't of being it? sick. Of being not being ill. Of being with throwing vomiting, up. Of vomiting. Yeah. Mostly right. affects women. Um, right. But it, it, it completely traumatized her life. She went through the book by herself five weeks later, completely cured. Right. She she is like you. Yeah. You got. In fact, she's not from far from here. Right. I'll, I'll introduce you one day. Right. The thriviest, happiest octogenarian i'd ever meet right she what's learned an o- what's an octogenarian someone who's 80 or over oh right okay <laughs> right sorry I'll hopefully i'll be one of them one day <laughs> I'll, try <Yeah>. and, uh, <laughs> I'll take that right now yeah. okay i'll keep the word shorter right <laughs> <laughs> but she is the loveliest person alive right and she's just like you and she stops people in this well not so much at the moment t- you know she goes around old age people's homes teaching people it's a skill set hmm. anyone at any age can learn hmm. right so that's that the next thing to realise is it comes from a completely different perspective to the, me- the the medical view of it. Completely different perspective. And that's why in certain areas the, uh, my programme is more successful than traditional techniques because everything else comes from a different angle to what Thrive does. Yeah, The Thrive programme recognises that mental health or, or how well your mental health is, how good your mental health is, is mostly 90, 95% down to the skill set you have. Where even most medical professionals, right, and this includes all the psychotherapists and psychologists I've ever worked with, and I worked in a multidisciplinary practice for years in Cambridge, even most of them believe that your mental health is something that happens to you. You know, if, you, if you've got 10 people that were depressed and you put these 10 depressed people in front of 10 GPs, most of them will go, I, I don't know why he's depressed. I've no idea, right? And all they can do for you is medicate you. Yes, medicate you, yeah, okay. which I'm so... I've, I've got people in that position in my and life. And that's the and worst possible... Think about it, right? Yeah. It's the worst possible thing because by giving someone antidepressants for depression, unless there's no other way, obviously, if, if, if there's nothing else and nothing else is going to work, and antidepressants will bring them up to a level on that continuum where they can then do some cognitive stuff, function, then fine. Yeah. But that, you know, if it, when they're handed out like Smarties, the worst thing is to be told... You've got a brain chemistry problem, Dan. The only thing that can solve it is tablets. Because now you're feeling even more powerless. And this was yeah. your friend who stayed with me. How do you feel about working uh, with people ben. that are on antidepressants, but they're using, they're using a bit of both as well? I, I, we've got no problem with what, what they're doing. You know, people, people do what they need to do to get by. And, and what we do say, if, if, for your listeners, right, your watchers, if, if they're already on some antidepressant or anti-anxiety medication, right? Not that I'm a GP and I can't tell them this, right? Don't change anything whilst they're going through the program, right. okay? Because it's really important to note that when you're changing and you're feeling better, you know that it's coming from you and not because you change the tablets. There's a baseline, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so speak to their GP if they, if they want to come off something later on, blah, blah, blah. But, but don't make any changes while they're going through yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Because it's so really important to know. To know. I'm feeling better this week because I've been doing this differently or doing that differently. If you're, like, if you're on a diet, if you're losing weight, you want to know that this week you've lost those two pounds because you exercise more, not because you use different sugar in your tea or whatever. That's yeah, really yeah. important. So yeah. going back then, mental health is, is a is a skill set that anybody can learn it's got nothing to do with where you're born how you're born anything else right you learn these skills right just like your accent where are you from originally uh, well, i was born in south end south just down end. The road, so toby where are you boy. from i'm from here um, you're from here yep jesus well, where are you I'm from, from Wiltshire, Gloucestershire. <laughs> well, perfect okay now you two sound different okay not as different as I'd have liked. Well, what I'd loved is a thick Irish brogue <laughs> accent here in a Boston accent. I can pull on full, full on Romford for you, Geese, if you want me to, bro. Yeah, do, yeah, yeah. Well, I, can, I, can go, I can step straight back into that. Okay, case. it's not that <laughs> different from what you were doing, though. Yeah, no, it's right. not really, I no. I, no. I, 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 I would like to it. say I'm an, Essex, I'm an Essex boy done good. Okay. You know, I, mean, I, I, don't, I didn't want to talk like everybody else that, uh, in the school I went to, you know. Um, but if you think but, about a strong accent, you think about a Billy Colony accent, yeah. Connolly accent, right? Yeah. And then you think about Simon's accent. 
why does Simon sound like that and you sound and I, and I sound like this? Because the people he grew up around sounded like that. That's it. All you do is copy the people you grew up around. I, f- right? I think it's really weird when you see an Indi- there's an Indian chef who's Scottish and he talks <laughs> with a proper Scottish act, like Glaswegian accent. I just think it's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. It just so throws you, doesn't it? But it's just, it's no, just that, brilliant. That, that Paolo Latini, the, he's a yes. singer as well. He's he, he, Italian, isn't he? Mm. And it's the strongest Scottish accent yeah. you've ever yeah. heard. Well, Billy Connolly now knows he's been living in LA for 20 years, sounds American. Mm. Yeah. But the point is this. Your, your accent, uh, the language you use, you know, everything else, right? You only sound like that because you copied it off your parents and the people you grew up around, right? Mm. Well, of course, you didn't only copy what they said. You copied the way they thought and the way they, they acted and their beliefs and their attitudes. You know, yeah. If you grew up around a mum who screamed and jumped on the table every time she saw a spider, you're quite likely to have a, a, a spider phobia, right? Or at least be a bit catastrophic in your thinking. And, you know, social yeah. anxiety, social phobia mostly comes from from your parents mostly comes from if your parents are socially phobic or one of them you're going to be your mum keeps telling you to stop picking your nose I've in got tesco perfect example of that Go on. so my little girl will t- hello i'm violet talk to anyone will <laughs> you be my friend straight away <laughs> like you know and i'm i used to be i'm not now i'm not anymore but i used to be standing there thinking i've got to talk to their parents now oh no and i'll be like violet come on darling come on and, and you're teaching her to be socially phobic because yeah. you're embarrassed about having to make small talk with somebody you've never met, where she's off and running and holding the little girl's hand or little boy's hand, running off playing hide and seek or mm. whatever, mm. you know. And I, I, I know I've done that, and I know a lot of parents will have admit to that as well that they've pulled a kid out of a situation they're loving because they're uncomfortable yeah. <laughs> with it, and then you're teaching them to be like that, aren't you? Mm. You know. But all um, of these things, all of these things, you know, uh, this skill set we copy off our parents, off our peers, off the people you grew up around, right? And so whatever way you were taught to think 30 years ago, you know, <coughs> excuse me, you're still thinking and acting and responding that yeah. way now. So what you learn with the Thrive Programme is, is someone said this to me the other day, and it's utterly brilliant, and I'm, I'm going to hashtag this. The programme has taught me how to think, not what to think. Yeah, brilliant. Isn't yeah. that good? doesn't change you. No. doesn't change you. You just, you're just a... Uh, a better version of yourself, more able to cope with all the stuff that's thrown at you every day that, that happens to all of us all the time. Yeah, 100%. Um, and like you said about making the right decisions, now like ev- every day I'm just crushing it. Every decision I make is the right decision, you know? Just like everything, from even from picking him up today from the, from the boss name. Normally, in the past, I would have left it to the last minute and been really late and driven at a million miles an hour to get round there and been apologising and all that sort of thing. And I'm like, right, he's going to be there any minute. It's going to take me about three minutes. Boom, I'll get in the car. Boom. And he, and he was waiting for like a minute or two yeah, minutes seemed, or something. Seemed a bit longer. So <laughs> how about... <laughs> <laughs> and he, and he I didn't, bit me out about 15 you, times you, and he just looked straight through me. You didn't say like, sorry. Well, I think you why rehearsed is this, this story Why, why the is this bloke yeah. not driving a Ferrari? <laughs> why is he picking me up with, in an old grey van? In know? honesty, mate, oh. I was frightened. All, all I know, well, I've never been I've never been you to were Basildon <laughs> train station. You should have been frightened. And there's a weirdo in a van waving and bibbing at me. Do you not see me trying to look the other way? Yeah. Lucky I left you in the back. Welcome to Basildon. Thank you. So, so, so getting, yeah, getting back to PTSD then, because because I I know uh, I've worked with these guys at iCarp and we use them um, as some of our manpower for if we do a work party on a lake and we have to drag a load of weed out. Um, Ex soldiers are brilliant, yeah, because they're just machines, you know, and they just get on with it. You show them how to do it, and they're just away. And I have to say, John O, who's the bloke who's done most of it, he's just a force of nature, you know, and he's been. He, he's, he was, I think he was a para. He's been in the Balkans. He's been tons of places, um, and he's very, very vocal about about what he's been through and and everything else. And um, he's become a therapist yeah. through through yeah, it. I think brilliant story. as part of a part of his recovery from it and um, dealing with. But it. I mean, he's been tremendously tra- traumatized as well by he, it. Hasn't he has. He? Yeah. I mean, um, so. Sorry, Peter, do you want to just explain what PTSD is? If anyone hasn't already watched our previous podcast. Yeah, so PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, anybody can get, any, anybody can suffer from it, right? You don't it, have to have gone to war or seen no, anybody blown up or anything like that. You no, don't. no, but obviously the more traumatic, the more likely you are to get it and the more likely it is to be long-lasting. Right. But um, I think about 30% of, of, of women 
that had difficult childbirths can go on to have PTSD. Anyone that's been brought up in an abusive relationship or been in an abusive relationship, had parents or alcoholics, or, or, or a single shock. We took a guy through a couple of years ago that was um, head of security at the um, Hippodrome in London and got mugged and tied up and hit with baseball bats one night when they licked load of money from the casino. And he was in a right old state until he went through and sorted his head out with one of our guys. So anybody can get it, right? Even if you are, even if you're really high up on that continuum, okay? If he doesn't watch his back, okay? And, um, you know, he goes through a, a series of traumatically stressful situations, you could come down on that continuum and suddenly find yourself suffering from PTSD, mm. okay? Yeah. So it's a high anxiety state, it's hypervigilance, it's it's flashbacks and forgive me for doing this hope you got that on video tobe yeah, flashbacks we'll yeah. talk about that in a minute flashbacks it can be lots of guilt it there can be associated sleeping problems um entirely suited to to someone that uh, that wants to act like a loner so uh, ex servicemen ex professional yeah, sports people they all say about that high performing people yeah. high performing people um that that just feel absolutely wretched sometimes for years and years and years and years afterwards and feel utterly powerless to do anything about it that 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 characterizes ptsd essentially and uh, someone like jono is i mean his experiences i mean he was in kosovo and he was in a in a room full of like dead bodies there were bodies everywhere and he and the, the ptsd is uh, associated to the smell and the sound of those jets flying yeah. over. So every time he was on a fishing trip in France, and when he heard a jet fly over, he literally went into a panic attack straight yeah. away. So his, so his beliefs are kind of based on that reality that he's he's experienced out there. I mean, how do, so? How do you distinguish between that, that as a that, that's a that's a real belief? Yeah. You know, and so how do you how how could you work with him around that when he know when he's he believes that because it's real. Okay, so here, here was something that was in the Guardian today. I put my glasses on, getting old, right? Let's read you these two paragraphs. So this is a real story uh, in the Guardian today. I don't normally read the Guardian, by the way. It's the only paper that was there. I don't read any paper, mate. So I'm not going to hold it again. And this you. is a lovely story about a guy who who was a veteran, um, had severe PTSD up until the age of 60, managed to get over a lot of it and is now helping other people. But I just want to talk to the language, right? This is what it says. Like many before me, I had the panic attack. They'll find out that stuff buried in my mind, memories I had pushed away, a dark, disturbing box of images constantly fluttering subconsciously, a shark threatening to surface. Uh, I spent ages in the toilet shaking like a leaf and pulled myself together and went things. So all of the language is about how powerless he and they feel about these memories that they believe are somehow trapped in the back of their mind and these emotions we talked about before that are somehow trapped there and that is the narrative that you are told if you have PTSD no matter where you go or who you see in the world for PTSD that is the narrative you are told because of course it's coming from a medical perspective okay and actually it makes sense, you know. We, it makes sense to talk about it in that way. That that you know, um, yeah. You got the reason why you're feeling bad is because you've got these trap memories that you haven't processed properly because they were so shocking and they're they're hidden away and there's nothing you can do about it and they're there and it may be a smell will set them off or, or you'll hear a, a song on the radio. Remember our tune? You're not old enough. Our tune. You're you're too young to. When we were growing up, we're was all it, too young. Was it not Dave Lee Travis? It's the other fella. Du, 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 du. And there was an hour tune on the. It's just me. Am I that old? <laughs> you're, you're, well, you're, right. I'm older than you, and I. How old are you? I'm trying to build you up, mate. How old are you? I'm 53. Oh, you're older than me. Yeah. <laughs> you're well old. <laughs> I, I feel it. <laughs> you're but, all well old to me. Don't worry. It's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Shut yeah, it, so. All right. So the yeah, problem is the problem is the problem isn't what's happened. The problem is how powerful or powerless you believe about it. And I'm sorry, I've got to take a segue for one minute, okay? Five million smokers around the world die every year from smoking-related cancer, okay? And yet, the vast majority of people want to quit. I think it's about 87% now. 87% of people say they would quit if they could. 92 or 93% of those people give us the reason they can't stop smoking. They're addicted 
right? Which they're not, which is nonsense. That's never been proven. It's utter bollocks, right? But because they believe it, they don't put any effort in. Like the people that are overweight, that don't put any effort in because they don't believe it make a difference. My father died 22 years ago of smoking-related cancer, and he carried on smoking until the day he died. Okay? If you feel powerless, you don't put any effort in. So 5 million people, or, or 87% of 5 million people, right? 4.5 million people die around the world every year because they believe they can't stop smoking. It's not that they can't stop. They believe they can't stop. Okay? So the belief is absolutely massive. Because, mm. they, because you're told you're addicted, there's nothing you can do about it. Like Ben was told, he had a brain chemistry ben problem. Harvey Murray. Yeah, yeah, with his depression, he was told he, nothing he could do. He didn't do anything. Yeah. At the moment, he was told there is something he could do. He did it, and he cured himself in a fortnight. Right. So that's smoking. Okay, that's smoking. Relate that to PTSD. You're trying to recover from something incredibly, or lots of things that were incredibly traumatic. Okay? The last thing you want to be told is it's beyond your control. There's nothing you can do about it. You've got these trapped memories. You've got these trapped emotions. They're going to come up randomly. All you're doing is adding, even if that were true, all you're doing is adding to the person's sense of powerlessness. And then they're just, oh, there's nothing I can do about it. All I can do is take the medication and do this you stuff. You do see that in all the guys I've worked with, that there is this, this powerlessness to them about themselves and even with Jono Jono feels powerful about helping other people but not powerful about helping himself you know and uh, yeah we, we had one we, we were up at one of the lakes working and a bird scarer went off next door so the shotgun sound one of the blokes was under his bed chair mm. clanging, clinging onto his bed chair for dear life you know because a bird scarer went off next door which is you think you know, as you said Amiga, it's, but, a, it's a classic phobic response right yeah. you've been sensitised to something I, I used the analogy the other week of being bitten by a dog, didn't I? Yeah. 50 years ago, you're bitten by a dog. What's causing your phobia now? It's not the memory of being bitten by a dog. The memory doesn't exist. It's not the emotions you got bottled up. It's the belief you have. You've got a belief that dogs barking at you is scary and you might die. Therefore, if a dog barks, you do that. You, all you need to so do... So that guy's got a belief that that sound could kill him. And that's why he's underneath his bed chair it's, cowering. Yeah, there, it's, it's, or similar. Yeah, that's a very simplified version of it. Yeah, but right. it's, it's, it's much more layered than that. But what is he frightened of now? What are you frightened of now? That dog doesn't exist anymore. What are you frightened of? Why are you still running away from that dog that's not even real? Of course, it's the emotions that you create about it that you're scared of, not the dog itself. Right. There's so many phobias, right? In fact, all phobias are about being out of control. Well, you've got a bit of... A bit of Thank you, mate. It's really annoying me. Sorry, mate. <laughs> Thank you. you. You haven't lost your... Uh, is, that your is that your gift? <laughs> that's is that it, your yeah. gift? Yeah, yeah. There no. you go, Simon. Yeah, thanks very much for that, yeah. It's, it's Thrive Rob. Orange. <laughs> Thrive Orange gift. Great. Leave yeah, yeah. great. Yeah, that'll, that'll be... Put that'll that'll just put it, I'll everything put it next to my that. actual <laughs> gift, just down there. That'll be worth right. five or ten pence in a few years' time, that one. That was like one of them sweet moments at a date where you want a crumb off your date's cheek or something like that. Are we going to get to third base? Absolutely. You're staying at mine tonight. I'll leave the cameras on, <laughs> so this is so, and I really I desperately feel for people that have got PTSD. Having suffered anxiety myself, right, I desperately feel people that did. The problem is that they believe they are powerless. It's not that these traumatic and horrible things happened. The problem is that they believe that they are powerless because the narrative they've been told everywhere in the newspapers, on telly, whatever, by therapists, been, by by therapists. But it, yeah, here's an advert: look for post-traumatic stress disorder. As an advert, it says, it's not that the person is refusing to let go of their past, it's that the past is refusing to let go of the person. Mm. Okay, that's an advert for a PTSD association. How disempowering is that? It's not your fault, right? It's, it's nothing you can do. There's something going on in your brain beyond your control. That's what depressive people have been told for 30 years. Okay, hence they don't do anything about it. All they believe is, i got to seek some medication for it. So the first thing is for people with PTSD, the, the, the treatments are relatively unsuccessful, okay? Relatively unsuccessful. You can find the odd person that feels a lot better, but I would defy you to find someone that's completely got over their PTSD, okay? Because what happens is they don't. They just get better enough, or like people with other anxiety disorders, they get good enough to cope with it. The problem's still there, but they they, they manage they, they manage a lot better. Right. Okay. Well, of course, the Thrive way, as you know, Daniel, is is that you, Daniel. 
I've that, turned that, into that, a client. Well, now, that's me I? being. That, yeah. <laughs> How are you feeling? <laughs> that's uh, uh, that you can actually resolve the stuff that's there because it's not actually there anymore. You don't actually have a memory. A, a video of being bitten by a dog or of seeing your mate getting blown up or of being knocked off your bike or of Jimmy Saddle fiddling with you 30 years ago okay that doesn't exist anymore all you have now is the knowledge that it happened and then how you choose to respond to it so you make a choice to respond to it differently and you can train yourself out of those responses with, with you know from you've just been through it with relative simplicity okay and the more effort you put in to manage those responses the further your mental health generally can, moves up on you, that continuum can you give us because obviously i've not gone through the thrive program in order to deal with ptsd so i don't know how how it step by step it is applied can you give us an exactly example the same. Exactly can you give the same us an example though someone's got ptsd from combat um wh what are the what are the like the actual actual actions that somebody would take that would start to improve okay so their, their their mental well-being so i think we said before anyone the thrive program is a training program to help someone improve their mental health to the whatever degree okay so the program isn't different depending on who's going through it so the program for ptsd is exactly the same as a seven-year-old going through to feel less anxious at school it's the same that mary went through same anyone with it, okay you are learning to thrive. As you are learning to thrive, your mental health is going to improve and your skill set is going to improve to the point where you find it much easier to deal with the pressures and hurdles and li of life. Mm. One anecdotal point, I was taking a guy through years ago who got sent back early from Afghanistan. I think it was two para. Got sent back early. Um, or his time was up early and he wanted to stay. And he'd... Um, a, f a friend got had got shot on stag and it should have been him that night and he didn't do it for whatever right and I'd, i i this was this must have been about 15 years ago because i was still doing therapy before i finished the program created the program and i'd done all my best therapist shit with him everything i pulled out every i was even you know tried a bit of freudian and i'd done everything with him right nothing was working and and I didn't really get a bit annoyed with him, but I, I played the annoyed friend. And let's say his mate was called Dan. And I just said to him, he was just recently back from Afghanistan, right? Hadn't made love to his wife since he'd been back. And I don't think had cuddled his baby son or daughter that was r relatively young since he'd been back, right? And I said to him, if Dan were here now, what would Dan say to you? He broke down crying got up and were cured it was guilt only the guilt guilt was a massive part of ptsd particularly for military it was the how guilty the guilt and the brooding and the ruminating you mentioned a, mi well, a minute the guilty ago. that you lived and somebody else didn't yeah guilty that he lived and his friend didn't and mm. that was trapping so all that did was give him a little bit of perspective which you know is part of the program step outside of it would your mate really, if your mate was still alive, would he really be looking down on you saying you should have done this or you should have done that or you're a bad person? No, his no. mate be saying, the fuck Live you your doing? life, mate. Get on with your life, mate. Get on with your life, And the yeah. moment he had that, yeah, do you know what that's yeah. In fact, it, what he would have said is, get on with your life. Yeah. The moment he thought that, he stopped brooding, his mood changed dramatically, and I didn't see him again, but... Yeah. You didn't see him again after um, that, wow. Uh, is that, and is that one of the reasons why... In the process in your positives one of the steps is what what would you say to somebody else yes. if they'd if they'd had that positive experience yeah. so it's taking you out and a really hard you to think about. a really hard thing for people to get as perspective particularly you know if you if, if you've got really strong beliefs and you absolutely believe there's no way you would ever run that marathon or do that or get over that problem mm. so and and self-esteem particularly some people find it incredibly difficult not to praise themselves but to just just recognize that i did a good thing there or, or, or it was nice that i helped that old lady across the road and they won't allow themselves to do it so if they don't allow themselves to do it you say okay what would you say to somebody else that did that oh i'd say well that's a great thing for you to do simon stopping helping that old lady and you say well hang on a sec if you thought it was great in simon why is it not great in you that's so true mm. Mm. that's so true yeah. we're always so yeah. much harder on ourselves aren't yeah, we? yeah. Are, well that's you. a classic perfectionist yeah. Right. Yeah. You, you, but you see that all the way through 
the book and um, as you're working through it. And uh, so I've done a lot of other personal development stuff and there's nothing else that it, it gets you to be kind to yourself. Everything else is putting yourself under massive pressure to go beyond yeah. where you would normally stop and to be your word and to perform and all that sort of, you know, and it really, you're in this amazing sort of uh, room with another 150 people that are on the course and everyone's saying, yeah, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I remember thinking, I, I, I'm like one of the things I'm going to do, I'm going to tell my dad I loved him, you know, and I haven't told him for God knows how long. And then you leave the room and then you've got to go back in a week and you've got to, even if you're not going to stand up in front of everybody, the people, the person sitting next to you, you've got to say, were you your word? Did you? And like, I was in tears before I said it to him and I did do it. But it was excruciating. It wasn't. This is not the Thrive Program. Yeah, this is by not the, the way. Thrive Program. This this is the Landmark Forum. Have you heard of Landmark yeah. Forum? This is Landmark Forum, and and that's why I would. That's one of the many ways I would say this, doing this training differs from things like that because it isn't massively confronting and um, upsetting, and it's actually an in, quite enjoyable experience. There are bits I got. I really got stuck when I read all these things. Thought I'm that. I'm that, I'm that, I'm that, I'm that. It's insurmountable. I'm overwhelmed. That's what I said to my coach. I'm massively overwhelmed. I've got all these things that I need to work on, you know. And and then you sort of learn further on that it isn't uh, uh, just a smooth upward. There's, you know, there's yeah. highs and yeah. lows and everything because you're you're retraining yourself to to think about things from a different perspective and a more a more sort of effective way that leaves you feeling better you know it's it's, it's it can be a rocky road do you yeah, know what i mean it's, it's, it's not road. it's not it's not it's not going to go sailing. it's not, it's not going to go up like yeah, that is but it? it's, it's not excruciating like it like i found things like the landmark forum to be and the guy that walked away from you after discovering what was caught you know what was causing the problem i mean did, did he have to continue working no, no, on the, the pro he'd solved it he he solved his own problem by getting that perspective you know, I could have, I could have kept, you know, I could have kept him in therapy for years. You know, delving into that his happens, past. That happens, don't you think? Really that does, happens. Really does, yeah. That happens. Do you think you ever need to regress then? No. Right. No, not at all. Right. Yeah. And we can talk. Listen, it's a whole podcast talking about memory some other time, right? But to touch on memory, the the the, the most up to date research from people called Okta and Shazno, if you look up in two thousand and five, said that memory is a constructive process at every stage okay we touched on it last time you're constructing that memory now that's it's almost semantic isn't it whether whether you What's really that mean? well w whether you really do have a video in the back of your mind about you being attacked by that pit bull or you create the picture now when i ask you to think about the pit bull you could say oh well it doesn't really matter does it it's fucking everything it's everything because if you have to create that picture then that picture doesn't exist, right? So how could it possibly be causing you problems? Memory is a constructive, a constructive process at every stage. And that's been proven, is it? Oh, it's very much proven, very much right. proven. But also, it goes the other way as well. There's lots of research into witness testimony that tells you that the more confident you are about your memory, the less likely you are to be true. Right. Right. So we're all involved in a in a minor car crash, right? And we go to the police and we report it. We go to court, right? And Dan says, "I'm absolutely certain, 100%, it was a blue Ford Escort." And you say, "Do you know what? I don't know, Rob. I seem to think it was a green Fiesta." You're more likely to be true, just because he's got lots of confidence in what he thinks he remembers. Doesn't add anything. And there's also all the stuff around. Around is that is that, is that why Hamidi's been so successful in life? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and probably and probably me as well because I I could not be told, you know. And people people, if you really believe it, everybody else really believes it as well, don't they? Yeah, hundred you know? percent. Yeah, yeah. And um, it's quite you know, and lots of tests have shown it's very very easy to get someone to think that something happened that didn't happen, you know. I can I easily convince you that you lost your keys this morning and it feels very, 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 very real. It feels as real as something else. Mm. So I'm not arguing that people don't have memories in inverted commas. How do I convince my missus to wear them little frilly knickers? <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think I should answer that. Yeah. Be well, actually, out, you can do it. You're staying at my house <laughs> tonight. All right? Ask so me you later. Can do it. Don't ask me on radio. <laughs> There's going to be a massive spike in viewing right in this minute. <laughs> <laughs> Every fella's like pen my paper. My missus is just going to look at this and just think, oh, 
<laughs> doing it again. <laughs> so <laughs> that they, they my, my, it doesn't feel like it. Okay, and I don't, I, I don't mean to. I'm not dismissing how awful people are suffering, right? But equally, you can't sugarcoat it and 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 describe it in a different way, like like cancer, right? You can't say, oh, you have got a tiny bit of cancer. If someone's got a lot of cancer, right? The opposite is also true. I can't collude with someone and say, yes, you're being traumatized by memories from 30 years ago when you were in the Vietnam War, okay, which is the subject of this guy here, right. because it's just not true. It's not true. You don't have those memories stored like that. You don't have the emotions stored. Every emotion you ever experience, ever, you've created brand new in that moment. Mm. If you think about the English language, right, we've got lots of phrases like, oh, lots of bottled up emotions. It's got, a lot, it's got a lot of anger coming up, suggesting that somehow these emotions are bottled up. It's not true. If you think about it, it can't possibly be true. So every emotion you ever experience is brand new. So if you have a panic attack now, thinking about that dog biting you when you were 40 years ago, you've just created that. And the only reason you would create that is because you believe it's there. The moment you come to the conclusion that it doesn't exist, why so would you feel so panicky? How, how do you get to that point then? You go That's the, the fried program. Do yeah. what you did. Yeah. Okay, you need but to, can, you need can to you learn give us a lot. little snippet yeah. of, of bits that you would learn because when you're the other side of it, right? When 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 we first started talking, when when um when uh, Rob and I first started talking, um He's, he, you know, you've got an illness hanging over you, haven't you, that could start at any point. I wouldn't describe that, it like that, obviously, but yes. Yeah, well, there's something, yeah. yeah. And, you, and you said to me, it doesn't, I don't spend a single moment thinking about it. Now, when I was completely and utterly consumed or consuming myself with the, the fear of the melanoma coming back, I could not comprehend no. you at the place where you were. I am now in that place. I don't give it a second thought, and I know that I never will. And you don't now. fall asleep worrying about I it? I sleep like a baby every single night now. I wake up in the middle of the night, as all of us in this, of a certain age do for a wee-wee, um, and then I go back to bed, and the only time I can't go to sleep is where I'm full of so many ideas of things that I'm going to do the next day. Because you're excited I, like, about life. I'm excited about it. I can't sleep then. The rest of the time, I sleep like an absolute babe. But when you're the wrong side of that awareness... So how differently it, do you feel then? So essentially, you can't describe what you did, right? But how, how, how was that then? How, how do you feel about... Because now I, I know that whatever news I got, I could cope with that news and I would still carry on to my absolute best until the day I drop dead. Okay. I know I will. And you, you, make, and you make the most of every single I'll day. I make the most of every single day. And you cope day. with anything I that happens. I have utterly pictured it, what I would be like. And also just the things I've gone through, having the scare for bowel cancer and it being being not uh, being negative, scare for stomach cancer being negative. I, like, I got to the point I'm like, it's not it until it's it. I'm yeah. leave, living like it's it when it's not it. And what a waste of my life. How many hours have I spent crying my eyes out? No more. That's it. You know, and, and that's and that's how I am now. So you so, feel powerful. Yes. Uh, uh, you ha you don't feel powerful necessarily over cancer, or, although you feel more powerful. You can wear sun cream and there's things you can do, yeah. right? But you feel powerful about your ability to cope. Yes. And you feel powerful that you're not going to allow this demon to ruin your life. Yes. So you're giving it the fingers, you're telling it to yeah. fuck off. Yeah. And because of that, you sleep like a baby. Yes. Okay. So what you did to achieve that, and I don't want to belittle what you did, right? You ch you change some beliefs that you had. The very first, and thing that was, takes like a split second yeah. to change that belief. When you do change it, it ta it does. You don't have to mull it over for God knows. Once it gets to that point, maybe you have to sit in it for a while and live with it for a while and everything. And you haven't you haven't had that. You haven't changed that belief. But the actual moment of changing it for me felt like a split second. It's always a split second. Right. You might spend three weeks or thirty years. Being consumed it with, over, with your, your, your faith, for example, but the moment you did out your faith or change your faith, something else, it, it happens in a second, doesn't yeah. it? Yes. At that at that moment, so it's just getting to that. Yeah. But you the feel moment, powerful. Simon, you decide to go fishing again. 
it will be a split second decision. Hmm. So I'm, will it? Right, yeah. Okay. All, and, and all that, and all <laughs> that conflict, and all that else, a suggestion, wasn't it? Even there's a Darren Brown moment that was even pointed at you. <laughs> but all that conflict around should I go fishing? I don't want to go back into it. Will I? The shorts don't fit anymore. Blah 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 blah. When you go, fuck it, I'm going to go. Bang, that's it. Yeah. Do you just find that you're just way more vigilant about your thoughts? And you, you, with a, I'm not. No, I'm not vigilant. I just because because of what I've learned through working with Rob. Um, and sometimes it's taken a while for me to get it and I've had to sleep on it and everything else and then other things have happened and I've sort of had more of a realisation it's sort of all come together it, it, it's, it doesn't feel like effort now it doesn't feel like yes it's effort to to get up and like I trained on Sunday on Father's Day it's my first training session you know I'm supposed to not be driving still I'm only four weeks post-op I'm not supposed to drive for six weeks Three and a half weeks, I'm driving to Norton Disney, sleeping in a bivvy and, and bailiffing and, do you know what I mean? And, and, you know, because my attitude is I'm going to make the absolute most of every day. And if I feel good, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to wait for them to tell me I'm allowed to do it. I'm going to do it. And I'm not going to be reckless and stupid, you know, but, but I'm, I'm, I know when I'm ready to do it and I'm not going to wait for someone else to tell me. And if you've got that attitude... You achieve more. Do you, you feel do like you've got your life. plenty of space during the day, though? Or I mean, he, he, yeah, absolutely. I don't feel under pressure now to get everything done or anything else. I've got I put absolutely no pressure on myself at all now. I just do as much as I can do. When I'm done, I'm done, and then I start again the next day. There's no, I haven't done this, I haven't done that. Just sit up worrying about it or. How often do you think these negative beliefs can kind of spring up during the day for you? They don't spring up at all anymore. I don't have any what, negative. What about prior to this? Prior to this, it could consume my entire day. It could be everything. One after the other. Yeah, other than when I'm completely consumed by something else. So I come in here, I, I, I might, I might feel terrible. I get in the car, and I just, I've just, I've just, Violet's just read another few pages of a book, and I'm like crying my eyes out trying to hide it because am I ever going to hear my little girl read properly? You know, get in the car, absolutely like that. Listen to a few of my positives on the way to work, or not listen to my positives on the way. Get into work. Someone goes, "Damn, what about this? Damn, what about that?" And then my mind's completely consumed with that all day until I get in the car and go home again, and then I feel crap again. Mm. You know, I'm making myself feel crap because I've got the space to make myself feel crap. Mm. That's what it, my existence used to be. He like. was responding to situation in life in an unhelpful way. Yeah. That's it. That's it, yeah. Okay. There's a, there are helpful ways and there are unhelpful ways. So it's the same for absolutely anything. Something as simple as a phobia. Is that the same with PTSD? Yeah, sim simple as a phobia or as complex as PTSD. You know, if I if you if I feel powerful about managing my emotions around spiders, I'll never have a fear of spiders. Well, so I used to be petrified, right, of spiders. And I can remember in our old, old offices, um, Damien, there was a massive spider in an envelope that just crawled into an envelope. <laughs> and Damien was sitting right next to me, knowing that I'm petrified. And he just got the envelope and he went, what's that? Like that. And I jumped about 100 miles. He's such a dick. Right? He's such a cock. It's <laughs> unbelievable. We used to call right? him the spider. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, I can get a spider that big and I can yeah. put it on a piece of paper and I can put a thing over it and take it outside and go, yeah. go on, mate, and let it go. Right, that is a monumental shift from one side to the other. I'm not scared of heights anymore. So after I did the programme, I, I, when no one was about, I took my shoes off and I walked round all the high walls in my garden and jumped from one high wall to the other like some sort of parquet <laughs> nutcase and just walked back up again. No, I used to get vertigo just looking down at the floor, yeah, yeah, you know, before. Yeah. So and because like, he feels powerful about managing his emotions around heights... Heights don't worry him because he feels powerful about managing his emotions that, around spiders. It was a bi complete byproduct. Yeah. I just because I felt powerful and in control in general, those everything other things stopped yeah, bothering me. It's a catalyst for everything. And and that, everything and that, could you say that for PTSD? PTSD, uh, if they feel powerful about life in general, the the concerns of P from PTSD will start to disappear. Hundred percent. Because again, everyone's on that continuum. The better your managing your reactions and everything else the fewer symptoms appear so the program we we, we, we co-wrote a, a, a manual on something called vaginismus which i won't go into here but it's a lady problem right uh, um and the program is the same for vaginismus as it is for ptsd as it is for schools right you learn to thrive you learn how to increase 
your skill set along this continuum and as you move along this continuum all the symptoms that were caused by your bad thinking or your unhelpful beliefs or your catastrophizing or your black and white thinking or your whatever your hypervigilance will just slowly disappear you don't even have to talk about them and i'll give you some evidence on that one of the worries we had when we first started using the program was bearing in mind we mostly dealt and helped victims of sexual abuse for all those years myself, myself and my colleagues what are we going to do when people need or want to talk through something we've taken about 60,000 people through the program now well 60,000 in total right about 20,000 of whom my coaches are taken through to my knowledge not one person that's been abused or has been traumatized or anything else has needed to after going through the program has come back and said but I still need to talk through that stuff Hmm. that stuff wasn't a problem because it was a problem it was a problem because of the way they thought about it yeah, and the yeah. narrative totally. they told themselves I did it once to, to a, a, a friend of a friend she went through the program in about in a, in a few uh, a few sessions four or five sessions normally six or eight sessions right and um, she was referred to me because there was something traumatic in her teens that was causing her all these problems and I never mentioned it to her and I called her when she's on the way home. I said, oh, so, I'm so sorry. I didn't even ask you what it was. She said, well, it doesn't matter, does it? <laughs> it doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. But it never did exist. Yeah. That was just the narrative. You just didn't she have had. the training yeah. to, to so just acknowledge to, For that clarity, and, uh, yeah. for people that are thinking they've got PTSD, right? I'm not saying that the symptoms don't exist. I'm not saying there wasn't huge reasons why they had it in the first place. You know, I've counseled hundreds of people through I've cancelled three or four thousand people through traumatic events. Well, that's what I did for years and years and years, okay? I'm not saying that horrible stuff didn't happen or they didn't witness something horrible, it went part of something horrible. What I'm saying is it's their symptoms are not caused by what they think they're caused by. The memory of you bitten by that dog doesn't exist. The emotions are not bottled up. It's the beliefs and the thoughts you have about dogs which were formed at the time that you're still carrying with you. You're still thinking the same way about dogs. When you change the way you think about dogs, your dog phobia will disappear. So when you change the way you think about a combat experience, your your anxiety, your fear about that will disappear. You'd have to do other things as well. I don't want to. Yeah, I was going to say how. I mean, how, how, yeah, so how do they how do they come to terms with that event in the first well, place? I mean, I'm sure you'd agree 80 to 90 percent of the Thrive program is educational right so we, we we call it a psychoeducational program right the understanding of it is the majority of the the realization that you're not powerless is 90 percent of the program because once you've got the right I'm not powerless. it's not happening to me I'm not a fucking prisoner in my own mind at all these things aren't true right what do I do then it's easy, isn't it? Because they're motivated then. Right, just do this, 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 and this. All centred around things Dan's talked about. You've got to look at the, the fundamental beliefs they have about life and about perspective and they, how their different thinking styles are contributing to stuff. Dan's mentioned one a couple of times. There's this brooding, ruminating thinking style. There's about another nine or ten I, I, common I thinking styles. I felt utterly trapped in that. Utterly trapped in it. I don't do it at all anymore. Right. Well, Not at all. I, I wanted to just jump in there because that was the, the bit I'm finding really interesting is how people get to that first step. Because Dan, you touched on it a while back. But you said you were you you found where Rob was with his problems totally inconceivable. Because I think people can get so trapped in their own heads. So would you say it's this ensuring you know that they they have got the power? Is that the first step? That well, the majority of their problem is because they don't believe they got the power. Yeah. So. Getting taking back that power is everything. Yeah, yeah. The realization of what you know, why do, and I, I spent fucking years in and out of therapy. I mean, most therapists I know became therapists because they were screwed <laughs> up, right? What you personally spent oh, yeah, years yeah, yeah, in yeah, therapy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, a, you right. have to as a therapist, you have to keep going for you know your counselling and your supervision and that. But I, you know, I, I was a very anxious child. I was a neurotic child. I had lots of in, in, insecurities coming into adulthood, and I spent years in and out of different therapies, and none of them fucking worked. Um, and I thought, and this is this is a tr absolutely true story. I, I was running a sex abuse course in Dublin. That's not how to abuse people. That's how to help people that have been abused. Just for clarity, right? Mm. Uh, um, in Dublin, funnily enough, at a Christian Brothers school. There's a story there, right? <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> okay. Sure, yeah. uh, um, and uh, 
I, I, I went through a traumatic breakup in a relationship. This was the love of my life, my first girlfriend, the first person I really loved. And I, I was absolutely up in arms about it. And I just finished the final touches to this program, right? But to answer Toby, I felt that my problems were so big and so real and so caused by this event. And I'm sitting in, in the bar at Dublin Airport, I'm sure you know it, right? On my third Jack Daniels, okay? And I'm speaking to a mate of mine back here and I'm saying, look, you know, this is just ruining my life, all this, you know, this must be about stuff from my past, you know, this is dragging up all sorts of stuff, um, blah, 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 blah. And I genuinely found a psychoanalyst in Cambridge, right? And I booked up the first three sessions. This is going to cost me 15 grand over the next three or four years, 15 grand a year, next three or four years. Wow. That's how deep rooted I thought my problems were. And I couldn't book the first session for two weeks. And my mate said to me, look, now you've done that and you've booked it, and you know you can do it. Why don't you completely put that to one side and throw yourself into what, what was originally called CLB, Changing Limiting Beliefs. Throw yourself into CLB just for two weeks. And if it doesn't help you a little bit, um, then you know you've got that as a back. But put it all to one side now. Mm. You've got something booked. You know that you're going to do it. Okay. Absolutely throw yourself into CLB and see if it helps. I promise you, I love my children. Right on my children's lives, no fingers crossed. Mm. By the time I'd landed back at Gatwick, I'm the person you know now. Right. Wow. It went in 50 minutes. 50 what, minutes. What, what, why, do you think, why do you think some people are just more comfortable talking about their problems rather than you know, talking about you know, positive? You know? It's difficult. I mean, I, I, I really didn't like the It's Good to Talk campaign because actually it, it's not good to talk. The reason why Dan doesn't want people saying, oh, poor Dan, you know, how are you? I heard the podcast. It's because actually it's not good for him. It might be good for us as his friends because we're worried about him, right? But it's not good for him at all. It's only good to talk if actually you've got a fucking solution at the end of that conversation. Yeah. Okay, mm. so... As my mate Andy says, uh, uh, two people who talk about a problem is two problems. You know, yeah, it's really very that's very profound. <laughs> yeah, you know, put that in the next book. <laughs> <laughs> that's really good, though. Yeah, two yeah. people with a problem, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and be, yeah, like you say, there's got to be some action that that, that is a, it becomes a solution to that situation. If I like were cancelling in like Samaritans and stuff like that, you know, when you know people are just talking to someone at the end of the phone about their problems, and like you say, they put the phone down, but there's been no resolution. There's to no it action. Whatsoever. There's no, no action. action, is there? Yeah, that's, that's not. That's not to dismiss those things, right? Because it. Each of these treatments and therapies, right, has has a place, and and used at the right time. Mm. You know, sometimes talk you do someone need down to talk from stuff. killing themselves yeah. or whatever. Sometimes That's you a very do need to talk pursuit, isn't it? people through stuff. Hundred percent, right? That has a time and a place. But anxiety, stress, depression, and I'm not talking about a bipolar depression, right? But anxiety, stress, and like a normal depression, do not happen to you. Right, they're not out here in the ether and happen to you, as Dan will attest to. Okay, you are inadvertently doing creating these things yourself by the way in which you are responding to pressures and situations in life, based entirely on a skill set that you could learn in a month if you worked your ass off. And it's not your fault. Your parents, your society didn't teach you it. But we go back to what I mentioned last time about thirteen to fifteen percent of kids that are abused as children go on to have happy, lovely, very successful lives and aren't negatively affected by what happened in their childhood, that's because they already had that thriving skill set. They didn't take it on board. They didn't blame themselves. They didn't feel guilty. They didn't say, it was all my fault. Why did they pick me? They just shrugged it off, thought, well, actually, you know, the old fellas, I've moved away now. The old man's not there anymore. I'm going to get on, have a lovely life and play football and blah, blah, blah. They didn't dwell on it. They didn't brood about it. They didn't have nightmares about it. And they responded in a really positive, helpful, adaptive way to traumatic things. I mean, our lives are full of traumatic things. We are all going to die. But that, that, that proves that it doesn't have to be that way. You have don't to have way. to deal with it that way. No. People are choosing to deal with it that way, and other people are choosing to deal with it another way. Yeah. You know, and, and if that's the case, then you can choose between the two. It's not, it's not set in stone, is not it? Not at all. And just think, you know, I only found out today that you're not on Facebook imagine had you talked about that on facebook right and your hundred thousand followers whatever or sort on facebook you've had a hundred thousand people go oh, poor dan poor dan that would really dragged you down yeah mm. 
Because mm. I'd then be poor mm. Dan, it'd be confirmed, wouldn't it? You yeah, know? and you don't want to be poor Dan. No, you want to no, be thriving no, Dan. Thriving Dan. Yeah. And and you and, and you asked a really good question a minute ago about not upsetting somebody by your kind of robust response, okay? And and Dan said it really well, okay. You know, Dan's a mate, I care about him, right, but I'm not responsible for how he feels, okay? If he's offended on that day when I say, I don't want to talk about my syringa myelia or my, my two brain operations, Dan, it's not helpful to me. If he's offended by that, that that's not really my fault. I've got to look after myself, haven't I? Yeah. You yeah. can't be responsible no. for somebody else's no, it's emotions. It's ludicrous to think that you're responsible for how you're going to react to what I say. How can I be responsible for your reaction that you've just decided upon? And how do, it's parents, tra isn't how it? do parents train us to be like that? Okay, you're making mummy really angry yes. by yeah. doing that. Yeah, of course. Stop yeah. doing that, Toby. Yeah. You're going to make your dad really cross. Yeah, I was yeah. quite good at that one. Yeah, they're yeah. training. Yeah. They're training you they're tra to be responsible. We, we, yeah. yeah, yeah. For it's other mad, people's. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah, and I say that to my little girl. I said, darling. I'm not making you anything. You're choosing to be like it. And sometimes she'll have a paddy in a restaurant and I'll take her outside and I'm like, she's crying her eyes out. I'm like, darling, the only person who can calm you down is you. So we're going to stay here and be really quiet until you can calm you. And when she calms herself down, I'm like, high five. You did that. What an amazing yeah. that's yeah. Let's go, that's let's go amazing back. Let's go back in the restaurant. Yeah. You did that. Yeah. You know? You've spoken to Catherine a few times, haven't you? Yeah. So Catherine's Force daughter. Force of nature, that yeah, girl. Yeah, yeah. Catherine's, Catherine's daughter's a little bit older than uh, 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 Violet, I yep. think. Not not much. But Catherine has been training her daughter from an early age to be very thrivey. <laughs> so when Catherine's now upset with her daughter for spilling drink on the corvette, the daughter, even when she was three or four, would go, Mummy, I'm not responsible for how you're feeling. <laughs> <laughs> and she'd, and she'd get, uh, Catherine would get on the fucking phone to me and say, I'm turning her into a monster. But you just think what the daughter will be like in 20 years' time. Oh, mate, a Vi massive force of nature. Vi Vi Violet's the same. She's going to rule the world, mate. She's going to rule. And she's still got, she's got loads of hang-ups and she always runs to her mum because she gets sympathy out of her mum and she won't go to me. You know, but like, we were walking through the park, right? I took her to the park uh, Sunday they're walking through the park and she said, Daddy, why can't I remember when I was a baby? <laughs> right? And, I, and she said, I can remember things now, but I can't remember from when I was a baby. I said, well, actually, darling, do you remember um, when you came out of mummy's belly, you cried and cried and cried and you said something to me about that when I said that to you? And she said, what, what did I say? I said, you said, well, it was really cold, Daddy. <laughs> and like, so, so I said, you can remember. I said, and do you remember also you used to cry all the way back from the park when I took you home because you couldn't talk and, um, and you just used to cry because you didn't want to leave. And I used to think, why am I taking you to the park? And she went, Daddy, that's all in the past now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, like, she's five. Oh, I love that. She's five. Yeah. You know, it's like but she, <laughs> she's going to rule the world. That girl. I'll show you one of the exercises, Tobe, uh, uh, to answer your question a minute ago. One of okay. the exercises, all we do, we, 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 we've got a quiz, right, that, that asks you 50 questions about the major areas of your life and it's really trying to find out whether you feel powerful in those areas or not the more powerful you are the more powerful you're going to react in that area right if you feel powerless around spiders you're going to react in a fright you're going to create anxiety if you feel powerless about cancer you're going to react in a frightened anxious way about cancer right so one of the questions a good one right is ghosts okay because it's quite a safe thing to talk about okay do, do you believe in ghosts at all no no at all no how confident are you ghosts aren't real how much would you bet me right now <laughs> i haven't got much money but uh <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd bet you i'll bet you 100 quid that ghosts don't exist 100 quid tobe no i've got some belief it's not concrete but i think there's something right fab okay so all i want to talk you through then is just an exercise i'm not saying and, and i'm no i'm not saying whether ghosts are real or not okay no, of course. okay but it, it but it's learning how to process information well learning to look at why do i believe that where did i get that belief from is that belief helpful okay so what you'll find is generally speaking people that believe in ghosts have had one experience excuse me have had one experience where they thought they saw a ghost they've got a leaning towards it right you might walk home from the pub one night right and see something strange in an upstairs window and one of your friends will go it was a ghost do you see it was a ghost yeah. In fact, there were lots of other things that could have been, right? But their first thought is, it was a ghost. So it's that bias of wanting it to be. And people have a bias towards paranormal activity, paranormal stuff, right? 
they always like to think you know their lucky number came up and all this kind of stuff right so a basic understanding of maths and statistics will teach you that it wasn't a lucky number at all right a basic understanding of where you process information so i say to people this okay imagine we're here now all four of us i can physically touch down right there you go that's extra he's here in the room with me but we all see a ghost walk through that wall now okay ghost of elvis just to make it a bit more fun right <laughs> the ghost of elvis walks through that wall now okay and we all see it and we're all shocked and frightened and amazed and whatever right but elvis this is genuine this is real right Elvis is standing there right now. Ordinarily, I do the accent, right? But it's on camera. Oh. Okay. <laughs> no, you, you've said it now. No, mate. I, can't, I, can't, I, can't, I can't even. I can't do it anyway, Toe, to be honest, right? But he says something to the effect of, I was in the area, right? I heard you talking about ghosts. Here I am. We're real. And we all see it. Right. Now, do you believe in ghosts or not? <laughs> We've all just seen him. We've just seen the ghost of Elvis. What yes. are you? Yes? Yes. Toby? Yeah. Okay. So that's how easy it is to convince somebody that something has happened. Okay. Okay. Just because you've seen something, I know we're, we're playing a game with it, right? I get that, right? But just because you've seen something, you automatically believe it, right? So you've jumped to the obvious conclusion first of all. Okay. And what we we train people to do is think, hang on a sec, there are other reasons why I might be seeing that. The most obvious reason, if you think about it purely statistically, the most obvious reason that the four of us are sitting here seeing the ghost of Elvis is it's a joke. Surely that's way more likely mm. than the reality we're seeing Elvis, right? The next thing is it's a trick. Some candid camera, there's another camera behind and right and my wife's going to jump out or someone's, ha ha, gotcha. Okay, that's the next most likely thing. The next most likely thing is there's something in the water. We've all drinking it. Okay, the next most likely thing is there's something in the air or there's something in the COVID jab. Okay, there are literally dozens of reasons, a zillion times more likely that we all think we're seeing the ghost of Elvis than we're actually seeing it. But most people don't go through that process. We, we, we believe kind of the first thing we think because that's the way we've been brought up to. We've got a bias towards believing that kind of stuff because your granny used to be a medium or your, your brother saw that ghost after this disaster or something right you've been brought up to believe that stuff and so you lose the ability to have that useful cognitive skill of just kind of thinking it through first of all and having realizing the effect and just having a bit of perspective on it right so yeah. you mentioned so i've i've had two lots of major brain surgery i've got cysts on my spinal cord i can't feel anything in the top half of my body muscles are being eaten away in this arm hand completely got no feelings in this arm and i at the very least i should have been in a wheelchair probably dead about 30 years ago but i never ever talk about it i didn't even tell family and friends that i was going in for the second operation which was about 18 hours long where they put uh, they cut off a bit of my cerebellum uh, um basically my brain was too big for my skull all right, and the cerebellum was pushing. I bet a few people have said that about you over the, over uh, the years, haven't they? Not in a nice way. <laughs> uh, 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 and it was pushing it, and they cut in there, and then I got a bypass valve stuck in my spinal cord and all sorts of stuff. But I said to you, I've never, ever lost a single night's sleep about it, ever, because I feel powerful about the way I react to it and about, about how I can manage my reactions mm. to that. And people will think that's mad, but you know you do the same thing with yours, right? But it's just you being able to look at it from a certain perspective and kind of wait up and think it through and choose how you're going to react to something. Mm. But most, most most people will avoid thinking about it as much as possible because they're frightened. Because they're frightened, and then that will maintain that fear. Yeah, but they're not frightened they of the thing; they're frightened of the emotions they create about the thing. Yeah, it's never about the thing. Right. What about people have experienced it? I mean, I've I've been I've been in a fatal road accident and uh, stuff at school happened, you know, which actually under hypnosis, all it was all revealed to me, which is probably a, a, in some respects a worse, you know, a worse scenario than just not knowing about it at all. But what about people people that are living with these type of things, but they don't actually realise? And you know, so I mean, I might have post traumatic stress due to a road accident yeah. but I don't necessarily even know so it's affecting my life but well the vast majority of people that have PTSD do know because if you think about it how could you know that you have it you, you, you can't maintain the belief 
of having PTSD unless you've got something to pin it on. Mm. Because yeah. PTSD is the belief Unless there I'm, was an event or I, something. I, I'm having recurring thoughts or nightmares since that car crash, since I was at war, since I saw that, that thing. So yeah. there's very little like, in the research. Are you, are you saying you're unaware that you might be unaware that you've even got it? Yeah, I mean, it's like losing a family member or something like that, isn't it, as well? And it, it feels like I, I feel really sort of desensitized from all of that. But um, but I just wonder whether there is there is something there, but I can't really sort of define what it is. Well, you can report back. You have got a book there, right? That's I've got your a book, book here. Yeah. Okay, so you report back in six weeks' time and tell us what you think about it then. Mm. But it, but even and we talked about it last time, even the way you'd react to the death of a loved one. So we're not saying that these things aren't massive and huge and traumatic. We're not saying that shit doesn't happen. It's not that shit happens, it's how you're going to deal with that. What are you going to do about it, right? What are you going to do, you know, I've already told my kids that when I die, they're allowed to mourn for one week. You can be sad and unhappy and cry and blah, blah, blah for one week. But after that, that's fucking it. You then celebrate life and you live your life absolutely to the full. Because in all probability, when it's over, it's over and you're not coming back. Hmm. So what's the point in you moping around this week? because you've had to have this draining it serves no purpose whatsoever no, no. and and every day that you were to sit around being depressed feeling anxious feeling stressed okay you know this is not a fucking timeshare you're not going to get that day back at the end <laughs> if you don't use it now no, that's that's yeah. done that day yesterday right where yeah. you were where you were sad and depressed all day right mm. that day's gone that's a whole day you could be learning french learning to fly a plane you could have been meeting new people you could have been mm doing all sorts of that day is gone oh, excuse me gone Dan that's yeah. n never getting that back Th you correct me if I'm wrong you now feel that each day or hour is precious yes because you know that you inherently yeah, know I inherently know what that, do yeah. I want to do with this next hour I don't want to waste an hour doing that or this yeah that's a funny thing isn't it, it is you, you really value funny thing. life more not less absolutely a million times yeah. the, the perspective is the important part isn't it it's changing how you look at the, the situation yeah. yeah definitely because you know your life itself isn't changing you're still getting grief off your missus or you're still you know in, in a job you hate or whatever but mm. if your perspective around that changes then suddenly that the, your ability to deal with it changes and your mood changes and you're having a, a better life even though all the other things in your life are exactly the same like the same with me that melanoma is still is still there in the background but i am choosing to not let it bother me mm. whatsoever and and it doesn't at all you know and that is a diametric shift from yeah. where i was even six weeks ago yeah yeah you know mm. um, and if you re if you relate that to ptsd then okay. we're not saying that fighting that war seeing that car crash being involved in that car crash or the best friend dying or being raped okay we're not saying those things didn't happen and those things weren't horrible and testing and awful, all this kind of stuff, right? But you do not have to uh, um, lead your life based on them. You, you can make a choice, which is what Dan's done, for how you choose to see that, how you choose to respond to that. And there are myriad books written about this. There's the one which I never forget, which is that fantastic book written by the, 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 the Jewish guy that was in the concentration camp. You've mm. read it, Simon. I know you have. <laughs> you know the one? Um, uh, Man's Search for Meaning. Thank right. God I remembered it. Man's Search for Meaning, right? So this guy's in a concentration camp and all around him are dying. His family are dying or dead, blah, blah, blah. And searching for some positive, making some sense, out, taking some power back out of even something as disgusting and horrible as that keeps your head above water. He wasn't surfing the wave like you are at the moment, right? But his head was above water. Mm. And there's loads of stuff written about those people written and about. And that's far more than most other people's heads were in that circumstance. You could, far understandable. More. Yeah, did he, he obviously survived the Holocaust. He did, indeed, and, yeah, yeah. He was a psychiatrist. Yeah. I forgot to say he was a psychiatrist before. Right. But it's taking, detaching yourself from the situation, not being labelled by it. Even Terry Waite, when Terry Waite was a hostage back in the 80s, he talked about, you know, you don't give over your mind do you that's no. the one thing you you know you're a, a, technically a prisoner of theirs well technically you were a prisoner of theirs you know the only thing i can do 
is is maintain my own mind, my own sanity. And they would talk through Beatles lyrics and and yeah. and anything else to keep your sense of power. Yeah, you can't control the thing, but you control how you respond to the thing. Mm. And when you've got that perspective of I'm 53, I've probably got 20 active years left. That's X number of days. I don't want a horrible day today. I yeah. want I want the I want every day to be exciting and interesting and meet new wonderful lovely people. Have to be tomorrow, obviously. Now, <laughs> uh, 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 exciting new lovely people. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You, you, you know, you, you have you have a zest, an excitement yeah. for life like you have. I, mean, I feel like I'm twenty. I honestly do yeah. feel like I'm twenty now. Yeah, I always find it fascinating. It's like it's, it's like waking up the sleeping mind, isn't it? Where you know, some people can go through a lot of their lives because motivation is 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 is. is holds so many people back as well yeah. doesn't it and uh, are you surprised at the uh, the re the reaction to doing your course the response to doing your course can have on people's motivation because an awful lot of people they're just not motivated for, they they live a whole life with no motivation yeah but motivation is directly related to what you want to achieve and how likely you think you are to achieve it right i'd love to run a marathon right but right now, you're not I've got, built for it, brother. Thank yeah. you. I know. Thank <laughs> you so much. You let me off the hook. Right? <laughs> I thought you were going to set me a challenge. Say, right, all four of us are going to do a marathon. No, I'm not doing a marathon, mate. Steady, mate. Steady. I'm not built for it either. Yeah, yeah. But do you know what I mean? How, how, if you're at the if you're at the start line of a marathon and you've got the belief, fuck me, there's no way I'm going to do this. I can't even do a 5k. How much effort do you think you're going to put in? But if you believe you can you're more motivated because the outcome is far more likely. So motivation is directly related to how big you perceive the benefit is and how likely you are to achieve it. Your kids are going to work harder with small incremental leaps, aren't they? Yeah. Than if you say, right, you've got to go straight to A-levels, Violet. Oh, no way, Dad, I can't do that. What's the point? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah you take a yeah. little, little bit at a time. A little bit at a time, yeah. The secret yeah. is it's trying to get people to work and 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 work subconsciously and not actually realise that they're they're doing this stuff as well. well you, yeah, it? but yes. you're not work you, with that. You're not working subconsciously. You're working entirely consciously, aren't you? And there might be subconscious elements. Which but but you want to you want you want that you want the, the subconscious. The most important word is work. Actually, doing some work outside of your normal life, your normal day to day grind. He's stepping out of it and saying, I'm going to work on myself and I'm going to get somebody who knows more about it than me to help me. Whether that's the bloke who wrote the book or actually having a coach or whatever. Mo I don't know anyone in my life who has taken on board a personal coach. Anyone, you know. Um, and I would say that's the same for probably most people that have taken on a personal coach. They probably don't know anybody either who have done it yet it makes such a massive difference to how you experience life and what you can achieve in it. You know, every single professional sportsman has got a coach to be the best they can possibly be, yet in life no one has, mm. you know? Mm. So how can we possibly expect it to be expected to achieve everything that we can achieve and be as happy as we can be? I used to really put myself down from not being happy because I'm living the life that everybody, you know, I'm, I'm a multi-millionaire, I run this company, I've got a lovely young wife, I go fishing whenever I want and I'm still miserable. I used to put myself down all the time, but I didn't have what I grew up with was a miserable stepmom, a dad who wasn't involved, a mum who was hardly involved. And what did I do? I learnt to be miserable mm. because that's what I was seeing, you know, all, all the time. That's what I was learning. And that's, that's the thing. It's work. Put in the working. If you put the work into yourself, you'll get it back out again. Would you have honestly been able to have said that five years ago? If, if I'd said to you, like, how do you feel, Dan? Are you, are you a happy person? Are you, is no, your life fulfilled? That shit, I, yeah, I, I probably would have given you the, the, the rose-tinted version of it um, and, and big up to it and pr probably not been as honest about the tough times. But if you'd wanted to... I've, I've, I've never completely shied away from it if you'd want to say well, what are the downsides of being in the position you're in probably when I'd started you wouldn't have been able to stop me telling you how crappy things were and this had happened to me and that had happened to me and that, that terrible and no one helped me there and da, 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 you know but um but I've always because I found something to channel my life energy into uh, into fishing and then into starting a fishing company you know, I, I had hang-ups and I had low self-esteem in other areas of my life. But in that, there was evidence that I was good at it. And I just threw myself into that, you know. I've actually got a... Um, sorry, Si. Um, Dan, I hope you don't mind me bring this up. We had an interaction at one of the um, quarter parties a few years ago. Yeah. And that's 
what you've just said has just brought it back to me because this blew my mind. Um, I remember I was hammered at the time, so I'll apologise. Right, I, must okay. have come I up think we were all hammered <laughs> at the time, so it was a call to Christmas party. Yeah. But I came up to you and I remember going, oh, Dan, I was like, this is the bollocks, mate. I said, look at everyone here. I said, this is the bollocks. I remember going to you, this must be the nuts for you to see all this. And I thought, and I truly believe that's you shared the same thought as me. I thought you'd look around and go on, this is epic. And I remember what you said to me, you went, I don't see it like that, Tobe. What I see is everybody's families, everybody's kids, everybody, and, and you, you gave a totally different insight into the, the difficulties of, you know, the other side of all these- The responsibility that, involved. Yeah, well, you removed that. yourself from out of it, didn't you? And just, and, and just focused on everybody else. Yeah. Like, so do you think you were like no, but es- I think escaping it, from but your that, own- that, uh, no, but That I think blew my mind, because I, 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 you said that, I thought, well, yeah, of course. Yeah, but that but that that's that comes from low self esteem and not having the self confidence that you can carry on achieving all this stuff and everything's on you. That's a that that would would, would have been uh, yes a thoughtful thing about them, but also like a oh my god. Yeah, that's what that, I, that's what I'm trying that to say. That kind of thing. Yeah. And yeah. and and yeah, if you if you if you don't if you doubt yourself, mm. you know, as we all do, and as I often did, then then you will have those. You'll have those moments when you're like, "Oh my God, this yeah. is all on me." Yeah, that's you know, it. Yeah, this is all on me, and um, yeah. So, but yeah, that was then. Yeah, that was it. What would it yeah. be now yeah. if I came up to you in my same? No, no, do you know self? now? Now I now I don't I don't I used to be petrified of the Christmas party because I had to right. go around and talk to everybody, yeah. and I'd have to self medicate with a couple of beers before I walked in there, and then ha- having I know we keep harping on about the Thrive program and everything but having now done that and being able to to truly appreciate what I've done uh, I I relish it I yeah. don't ha- I don't have a drink until about 11 or 12 o'clock at <laughs> night and I cannot wait to go and talk to all the wives and girlfriends and everything else and people I've ne- never met before yeah, yeah. because there's such an amazing group of people I absolutely love it, and I can't wait to stand up in front of everyone and talk. I've not had a beer or anything, and I absolutely love it, you know. And I've always been the showman, and that being a showman st- stops you from having to be intimate with people because you can talk to everyone but no one, yeah. can't you? Yeah. But but then face-to-face with people, I don't care if I can't remember someone's name. I'll say, I'm really sorry, I don't remember your name. That's fine, Dan, I'm da 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 and I've got and there's no embarrassment involved in that at all, yeah. you know, because I don't really don't care what people think. Mm. I really I, I know I'm a great person. I know I've been really I, I know I've built a brilliant company and I've got amazing people working for me. I know all of that, mm. and nobody can tell me any different. Yeah. No way can anyone tell me any different. When you know that, you're not worried about what other people think. You're not, you know, and that's you know from someone who was really self conscious all their life, really self conscious. That's quite a quite a step in the other direction yeah, absolutely. good you know. example of that would be georgie best right the best footballer ever yeah okay uh, there was a better real... than pele <coughs> yeah 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 definitely yeah, <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Manchester yeah. United. and i don't even i don't even i don't even watch football right? yeah, i don't even like i don't either but that. i know i know I, George I best e- is good and i so didn't even pele. watch the games over the last couple of weeks okay but i, I watched a documentary on him once um a quite a recent one and do you know what he was about 15, I think, when he when he was found to be good at football. And he was the shyest, most insecure person ever, if you look at this documentary. Okay, then he got lots of praise for being good at football. And basically, whenever he was scoring goals, his confidence was through the roof. Whenever he wasn't, it was on the floor and he was drinking. Mm. Yep. And he did that all of his life mm. until he eventually died. I had the pleasure of meeting his daughter a couple of years ago in London and she was the nicest person on the planet and we had a good chat about it then. But you can see his self-esteem, like the military, okay? So if all your life, your sole job has been loading that, loading that gun with uh, ammunition, right? Or, or, or keeping, keeping that, you know, keeping your gun pointed over there, right? Your entire role in life uh, um, and your, all of your self-esteem comes from how well you guard that position, how well you take that sniper shot, how quickly you can load that ammunition into that tank barrel, right? And then suddenly you're out in the military and you're not doing it anymore. You've got no self-esteem yeah, because you're not doing the job you've always done. You're not doing the job that you were trained to do to get good self-esteem. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Not doing it anymore. So the moment Georgie 
I think I can call him Georgie, right? The moment right. Georgie is not scoring goal that day, that week, his self-esteem goes forward. Because everyone's looking at him as well. I, 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 what are you going to score tonight? How many is he going to score tonight? Well, I don't know. And he doesn't score. Why didn't he score tonight? He feels like shit. Yeah, you mm. go to bottom. And I, I bet Paul Gascoigne is in the same exactly, exactly the, the same, same thing. Yeah. And I, I watched yeah. the the Friends reunion the other day, and yeah. Chandler in Friends, has used, he said every time because they filmed it in front of a live audience. Mm. Every time I did a gag and I didn't get a laugh, I was crushed. Yes. He was like the funniest bloke on earth as yeah. far as I he was, was concerned. Legend, yeah. And yeah. he has really <laughs> suffered since coming out yeah. of it. Massive drug abuse. Mm. He's got all new che- teeth he in front of rough, his face. He looked real rough, didn't he? He looked really yeah. rough. He he couldn't he couldn't articulate properly. You know, he was struggling, you know. Um and you just feel so sort of you you feel for the guy because he was the reality was my reality was he was so funny and he yeah. was so talented and he didn't believe he was himself he really but also didn't he was, it. it was funny he, he was though. the best one yeah. of both yeah. long shots he was the best yeah. one yeah. like yeah. a lot of comedians so it starts at that, no, that Jennifer witty, Aniston was the oh, best yeah, one oh yeah I mean, that's a given <laughs> yeah she Courtney was the best Co- one. I don't know Courtney Cox mate anyway no, no definitely no, not no, absolutely no I would have killed all my family for Jennifer Aniston <laughs> back then my god <laughs> she hasn't aged today, day <laughs> is she no she has she has when you see on that on that thing and and she like that Lisa Kudrow um, Phoebe, who wasn't my bag at all, but has had no work done by the look of it. The other two have had loads done. <laughs> Don't have work done, ladies. No. Don't have work done. Just grow old gracefully. <laughs> it's so much better. But look that, after that's your that's body. That's a self-esteem thing, though, isn't it? it is, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and, it and particularly yeah. if you're if you're in if you're working in in that show media stuff, yeah, it's all about all of your how self-esteem. you look. Yeah. yeah. All Chandler had to do, doesn't matter what the fuck he looked like, right? He just needed to be funny. As long as he was funny, he's got a great job. Yeah. And Ross just needed to do what he did and say funny things and talk yeah. about dinosaurs, right? Yeah. And Matt LeBlanc just be funny and eat loads of be burgers. Gorgeous. Yeah. And be say, gorgeous. Oh, how and how are you doing? Yeah. How, how are you, you doing? doing? <laughs> okay. Yeah. The girls yeah. needed to be lovely and funny and pretty. And, and they still do. Massive pressure. Yeah, yeah. massive pressure. T- tears yeah. of a clown, isn't it? Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. Do you remember the, the episode where she goes commando? Do you remember that? <laughs> no. Where where they're they're, they're, on, get, they're getting they're, 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 get, they're getting ready they're getting ready to go to Ross's um, uh, speech yeah, yeah yeah and and that's where where um, uh, what's his name um, not Chandler but Joey. Joey, Joey. Yeah. where's everything that Chandler's got? No, oh, yes. Yes, that, yeah. it's in that one. And at the very end, yeah, yeah. she she comes out in this amazing green dress and yeah. she says to him, "I've gone commando." Oh. And Ross is like. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! I know what I'm watching on television. Wowza, wowza! <laughs> I mean, she's still amazing, but I, but I, I just say to ladies, just please don't have the work done. Hell, look at Helen Mirren, <laughs> not had a bit done. She amazing, yeah, amazing. Yeah. But a confident yeah. woman. Yes, yeah, she's it just is, gorgeous it is, in every it is, way. Uh, it's a, it's an interesting segue, right? Because as boys, when we were growing up, there were n- uh, not ten percent of the pressures on us that were on our sisters no. or girls, right? Yeah. All we needed to do is play football, do our work, but we were expected to, to go be out scruffy. and be yeah. scruffy and climb yeah, yeah, trees yeah, yeah, and get yeah, in yeah, fights yeah, and come home yeah. muddy and pull legs yeah. off frogs and shit, right? Yeah. The pressure on girls and just about every culture, and particularly Western culture, now, isn't it? much, it's much, much higher. worse now. I really, you know, I mean, that's something we have to be... But I think with Violet, if she's got amazing self-esteem and she knows she can cope with anything in life that pressure she's not going to feel that pressure no 100%. Is she? she's Helen, not Helen Mirren was doing a show in the West End last year it was in a small theatre off Leicester Square and there's some people being rowdy at the front that was stopping people in the theatre hearing so halfway through her performance she jumps off the stage runs up the aisle goes out the front door and tells them to shut the F up because <laughs> they're doing a live show and they all walked off she came back and carried on with the show yeah, oh, mega right. before we finish because um, I do want you to meet my little girl um, uh, and she goes to bed at half seven so we need to get a jog on but um, there's a couple of other things to talk about the first one is from uh, if I put myself in the position of someone that has got PTSD and uh, is thinking about doing something different to how they've been treated so far i.e. going through the Thrive programme um, what What's the difference between buying the manual and working through the manual on your own and and having a coach? And how inexpensive or expensive does can a coach be? Because a lot of these guys are on next to no money. Yeah. You know? So let me answer that question firstly. The the programme was created from the beginning 
um, to be accessible to all okay so there's nothing in the program that isn't in that manual okay yeah uh, so there's no you other just work through it don't there's you no, there's no other secrets right? right what a coach does is is help a person get the most from the manual apply it in the best way uh, overcome any hurdles a- and uh, bring it more to life for them yeah. okay so for that reason most people would get more out of the program if they had a coach but mary the octogenarian that i mentioned she did it all from the book you mm-hmm. know far more people have been through the program just by themselves with the manual and it's written i think you'll agree in an engaging way it's no yeah, psycho and it, right? there's a lot of exercises to do there's questionnaires there's tick boxes yeah. for, for, for self-awareness and, and everything so else. My so my suggestion so would you're always... You're not just reading it, are you? You're working oh, no. through you, it. You, you, it is a training programme. Like we said the other time, right, you know, you, you can buy a book on flying, but it's not going to teach you to be a pilot. You can buy a book on martial arts, but you're not going to get to be a black belt, right? You've got to practice, practice, practice. Yeah. So I would always say, just go for the book first of all, okay? We, 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 you know, we, we don't need you to, to see it. We don't need I don't need you to see a coach, Right. The vast majority of people, nine out of ten veterans, will get enough out of the book, out of the manual itself, without the need for extra help. Okay, yeah. if they do the work, if if they do the work, they've got to do the work. They've got yeah. it. They've got it. Don't just read it; it's going to be of no benefit at all. Read it and work through each little chapter, going through some of the exercises that we talked about. There's there's lots of help. We can give them lots of help, and there's Q and A's it's, online. It's, I remember it saying in the book that people that can draw some positives from their experience in combat are far less likely to suffer from PTSD yeah. than those who simply focus on what went wrong. Well, people or, that can find a positive in any area of their life. You know, you talked about a minute ago when you were zoomed in on on uh, being ill, the only thing that would get you out of that is coming to work because it's go, go, go. And then the moment you leave work, you think about that again. Yeah. So any perspective that you can get outside of your position is going to be incredibly helpful. Yeah, yeah, okay. One, one thing I would say, no, it's having spoken a lot to people, uh, to guys with PTSD, veterans, uh, they spend so much time in their own head at home. So much time. And, uh, and the the the, um, the ease of slipping into drinking too much and all that sort of thing, doing drugs or whatever, at least this gives you something else to concentrate on for yeah. six weeks. If you even did nothing if, even else. If, even if it did nothing else. And most of you have got the time. You know, I know a load of ex-squaddies and, you know, and a John O and all that. And, you know, um, you know, I've I've worked alongside with them raking lakes out and all that sort of thing. And they're top guys. You know, mm. they're top, top guys. Mm. They work like Trojans. And they openly admit the worst times are when you're at home doing nothing. Mm. Yeah. They are the times, you know. So this, at least for 40 quid or whatever it is, this gives you six weeks or something of doing something else and you'll get a ton from it. And don't, for, don't it. forget, and this isn't a sales pitch, but if they, if they buy the book, right, and they don't like it for any reason at all, I'll just give them their money back. I right. won't ask them why or how or not going to make it hard for them, okay? They really have absolutely nothing to lose, right? Yeah, yeah. And if you've got any guys out that you know about that can't even afford a book, just get me their name and address and I'll send them the book right. free, free of charge. Right. Okay? You know, there's the, the, the stu- the stuff in there that will make a significant difference for them mm. and they're, they're, they just need to ask. Yeah. Right? It's, it, w- it will make a difference. Yeah. And what about... So if... Um, what what are the things that people are how are people treated with PTSD outside of this so what what happens in the medical profession so there are lo- there are lots of different uh, um that that lots of different treatments there's normal kind of psychotherapy normal CBT the what's, most what CBT cognitive behavioral therapy you could argue I don't want to step on anyone's toes a kind of a weaker version of thrive right like okay. the thrive program it's kind of a little bit like thrive but it's more focused on a symptom where the thrive program is all about you learning to thrive generally right so yeah. but it, there are tiny similarities right the most common though is this thing called emdr which is eye movement desensitization and reprogramming is that right yeah that's what you said okay. yeah and it's it's really in, it's really interesting, right? Because and I've studied all the research. There's lots of research, not just for PTSD. There's lots of research that EMDR can be quite useful for lots of things. Okay, and the idea is 
that you're reprogramming the connections in your mind between the memory, the trauma, the emotion, whatever, okay? The Cochrane Report, which is a, 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 cab a collaboration of like some of the top <laughs> scientists that have looked at all the research into it, says there does seem to be some benefit, this EMDR, but we don't think it's got anything to do with EMDR at all. <laughs> As in, it's probably nothing to do with the eye movement thing, right? It's exposure therapy. Because what I'm doing is, right, remember, you know, remember the car crash? Think about it. Talk me through the car crash, Daniel. Obviously, I'd call you Daniel, right, if you're a client, right? Yeah. Talk me through the car crash, Dan, blah, 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 blah. So you're exposing yourself to thinking about the trauma again in a calm room with a nice person with a soothing voice. And by telling you that by doing this, it's going to make it easier, it gets a little bit easier and a little mm. bit nicer. Mm. I don't know anyone that's ever been cured of their PTSD through any of these treatments. and um, I think we've got at least five or six video testimonials of people that have been, in their words, cured of it who are going through the Thrive Program. There's, right. a, there's a few of those. I'll dig them out and point them to you. Um, but it's just an interesting concept that people will grab at anything when their back's right against the yeah, wall. Yeah, yeah, you will. Okay? Absolutely, you but, will. But, but even then, right, even if it did work, even if, even if it was producing regularly great results, they should still change it to deliver it in a more empowering way. Mm. It's still no better than giving you a tablet. Okay, yeah, They're doing it to they're you. They're doing it to you. Fine, if it's successful and it's a, a useful treatment and it works, brilliant. Okay, Find a way of packaging it or delivering it in a way that's actually empowering to the client, mm. that's not deepening their belief about how powerless they are even further. Yeah, mm. That'd be my only comment on the subject. It's not empowering to tell someone that these things are in the back of your brain, there's nothing you can do about it, but if you look up and down and left and right and do this, blah, 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 you know, we can help you stop some of those connections or make it a little better. Even if that were true, which I doubt, it's not helpful in the way that's delivered. Yeah. Right, one of the other things, sorry, Simon, I wanted to ask about, because I've got mates that I would love to, to do this. Um, what about people that are, have, uh, are dyslexic, struggle with reading, that sort of thing? How, how would someone that struggles with reading get through, get as much value out of doing it as someone? Okay. So we, 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 we've taken lots of dyslexic, there you go, lots <laughs> of dyslexic people through the program. Um, and we, we, we haven't found that, obviously the, the book is quite wordy, there's 200 pages or something, right? But as we said, it's written in incredibly simple, plain English. Yeah, it is, yeah. Okay. But also, there are some support videos. So if there's any bit that they're not getting, they can watch these videos, uh, um, which will explain what's going on in that chapter anyway. Right. What I do think we could consider doing, we've never done this before, by the way, what we could consider doing, when enough veterans have been through it and got it, and are, are there and have got that skill set and they're keeping their head above water and they're surfing, we could train some of those up to help other veterans. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, well, that's yeah. what Jono's yeah. already done yeah. by, by, be, by becoming a therapist. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah, I mean, ICAP have created their own sort of army in themselves, haven't they? They by, have, yeah. By, yeah. you know, passing on their own experiences to each other. And, uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. That's, that, so uh, I'm trying to think what my... You carry on, Simon. I'll think of my last thing that I was going to ask. Do you always yet. think it's a good idea to have like, you know people that have experienced the same you know, symptoms to, to together? Like um? uh, no, which right. is why we've never done it so far. Uh, the only reason I'm suggesting that now is because uh, the reason that there are a lot of veterans out there that haven't got any money, and because the next thing with someone who, who you know has got a normal job and blah blah blah, I'd be well, look if you're struggling with the with the manual by yourself, Dan, go and see one of our coaches because that's expensive. I mean, you get you get what you pay for, right? It's expensive, yeah. but actually, if you haven't got any money, there's no point in saying that. So, if we could train up a few of these veterans that that absolutely got it and get them to deliver it, I think I think you're killing two birds with one stone. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I use Headspace um, meditation yeah. apps, and I, I find that really, really good for for keeping the motivation going as well. I've actually been diagnosed with ADHD like really okay. recently, and you and me both. Really, literally three weeks ago, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, well, that's interesting. Because you, you were. Yeah. Right. What? Really? Why? Why? How did? You, how did? That, how did this come to be? <laughs> you were stealing his question from it, right? But, but, <laughs> genuinely, I was at home one day, 
trying to write an update for the book, right? And I just couldn't focus for more than five minutes at a time. And I've always been like this, right? Some of my friends have always called me special and not in a nice way. Right. Okay. I can relate to that as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Uh, and because I've, I've always been pretty thriving, even when I was very, very anxious, you know, when I was younger. By right? thriving, you, you mean... Um, dealing with the challenges of life yes. and cracking on no matter yes. what and yes. making the best of yeah, it. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Even though yeah. for a long time suffering not, not, a lot of anxiety in the process, yeah. I, I've always had that do skill it anyway. set. Do it Fear anyway. Fear and do it anyway. Which, of course, people with ADHD are, are particularly inclined to, as are people that are dyslexic. You're more likely to be a successful business... Oh, no, that's not true. There is a, a, a disproportionately high number of successful dyslexic businessmen to non-dyslexic businessmen, right? Because if you've grown up with that burden, you either fall by the wayside or work harder. Or you try a bit harder. Or yeah. you try a bit harder. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? You find with the ADHD as well, it's, it's like doing the first ever podcast with you, Dan, isn't it? And it's like, um, people don't probably realise this, but we were, we were practising for months and then you come in one day and it's like, well, good, we're going to do it now. And um, <laughs> That was I the find with, of the podcast pretty much, wasn't it? <laughs> pretty well, yeah, that was it. And um, I found with the ADHD stuff, you need that kind of, um, you need that, someone to put you, you make you do something really really suddenly like that to there's actually no opportunity to jump no, in no and, opportunity and to brood over yeah, yeah, it yeah. Can't, you, you can't put it on the back burner and, and leave it there that was never well, we're that, always yeah our, our, our executive function on the front of the brain does, just doesn't work that way so we need you know we need chaos to, to make us react to things you know, and is that sudden. medically proven then, is it? It is, yeah, unfortunately. Are you... Um, right. so my, Sorry, just, can I just... Are, yeah. are you... Um, so we were talking about medication. Are you going to go down the medication route? Well, I, th- I thought... A friend of mine, I said to my friend, who, who's, who's a high-functioning Asperger's, I said to him, what do you do when you're sitting there for a day and you've got a plan to write, you've got something to write, and it doesn't come to you? And he says, uh, Red Bull. <laughs> Red Bull or caffeine and that like, hasn't worked so, so, so. and I was saying well that's no good so I, I was genuinely thinking about trying out one of the one of the usual medications so I went through the whole hog this is literally only three weeks ago right. with a psychiatrist in London right so the, the, the diagnosis for ADHD you, you can't do on the back of a fag packet you, you know the official diagnosis as you know you need to ha- go through a couple of hours with a psychologist or a couple of hours with a psychiatrist i went through both yeah, answering so, yeah. hundreds and hundreds of questions and talking about it. they both knew about the thrive program by the way right. and both of them use the thrive program in their clinics in london right. which i find really interesting right but uh, we were talking about finding something that would improve that focus and concentration and not have your brain zipping off all over the place and I, I did actually get a prescription and I took it for one day and then thought what am I doing because I thought the 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 negative connotations of wanting or needing it even if it really really helped were outweighed are worse than, are, are worse than that and the potential the, the, side effects the, the, yeah. so I've still got this little it's actually gen, the writ, written going to pass some drugs on yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've got a whole I've got a whole, geezer who's whole got, month who's got supply. a few days, yeah. oh, I, I've got I've got my I'm, I'm going to a clinic in Oxford uh, in a couple of months time but uh, I thought that was for the other thing <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> yeah. sorry mate. Yeah. Um, but actually getting back to the headspace thing with the meditation app would you ever consider maybe putting an, an app out there to we do are this working on our app as we speak right Right, right. Just gone through a consultation process with lots of ex people that have been through the program, and uh, we've got a guy from a, a, a German you, pharma company is helping us with it. Do you get people that have been through the program that want to help you that are experts oh, in certain things? Inundated. Because we, yeah, we get it at, at Embryo. Yeah. You know, people that a, a, a well-meaning project. You get loads of people that want to give their yeah. skill set and their time yeah. and everything to 100%, help. It's yeah. mega, mega that. Yeah. Really, really it's cool. lovely. I mean, even people <coughs> like you know uh, Simon Carver, who who heard about the program and just uh, loved it. So he's been sort of an un- uh, he's the guy that set up um, Love Film and then sold it to Netflix and this sort of stuff. Um, it was just uh, and people just get in touch out the blue. Blue. I said you may not have heard of us. We're so and so. We've been through the we're daughter's been through the program. We'd like to help you know tell us what we can do. And it's only now we got Catherine on board that I actually have five spare minutes a day that we can actually now look at some of this stuff like an app we should have put an app out 10 years ago but we just yeah, haven't had but, the but ha- haven't had the time that's, that's, but we are yeah. working on it 
and it's going to be yeah good. you should i mean i only read audio books now i mean with that stuff as well it's like it's a lot easier to yeah, listen to an audio book that would be great a than... book of you talking through the talking the book out would be great because when you especially people will obviously have heard your voice now as part of these podcasts and then if they hear your voice again talking through the program there's there is a real uh like serenity to it there's a calm to it when you when you when you listen to the the little videos that you've done okay. when you hear them because i've worked with you personally as as um you know to to be trained it just takes you straight back there yeah to hearing it and i think i think that's a great it's really important that's a great thing yeah, yeah. I, i've only done one audio book so far i um was uh one of the blokes in the sas in that in that foxy. who dares wins yeah not foxy no that um and Right, no, yeah. not Ant, no. Oh, we're going from... Um, yeah. Who's the other guy? Okay. Barry. Oh, is it Barry or something? No, there's... Uh, yeah. I, 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 sorry, but I, I know Foxy actually went... He had post-traumatic stress. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, he, he ended up getting um, into a bit of an emotional relationship with his therapist. And he was talking about, you know, that yeah. that's the problem. They're all, they all seem absolutely like lunatics and just make loads and loads of loads of really bad decisions. And this guy was going on about all the stupid things that he'd done and that and I thought how have you ended up in the SAS when you've made all these well, stupid that's, that's another stupid podcast decisions there. you yeah. know mm. um, I remember the other thing that I wanted to talk to sure. you about before we go is is addiction and alcoholism and all that type of thing right you uh, want to cover that in the two minutes no, the no, no I don't I don't but, I, but, but, but just just a bit because it's another massive thing for people that lots of people feel that they are addicted to smoking, they're addicted to alcohol, they're told they're addicted to alcohol. I've got a bit of experience of knowing someone who's who's dipped in and out of rehab, you know, and that you know they're told yeah. that they are addicted. They're told that the only way is complete abstinence for the rest of their life. They're, they're, they're made to feel more worthless, you know, um, and. So many people are going through that, especially now with co with um, COVID and lockdown and everything else. The amount of people that are boozing more than they yeah. were before, uh, and people that you know that I think that's probably the biggest one that people are, say they're addicted to is booze because it's so easy to get hold. I can, of. I can simplify the discussion for you, right? Okay. Just talk about the word addiction, and the word addiction means different things to different people like most words do right yeah you know when we grew up you would never ever hear the f word not alone the c word on telly now it's all over the place right so these words have changed their meaning a little bit so the word addiction to people that feel powerful just means your body might crave a bit of that if you stop it the word addiction to someone that's feeling powerless means your body needs that you're going to die if you don't have it okay so most smokers go back to smokers again the whole addiction argument smokers that are finding it hard to stop generally speaking believe that addiction means that you have to have it or you're going to die or something bad's going to happen or you can't live without it you've got to have this in your system yeah when you're going to lose it you're going to you, yeah, you, yeah yeah something yeah. really awful is going to happen yeah. when in fact it doesn't mean that at all. all all it means is your body might crave that for a few days until it's out of your system it doesn't mean you're going to die you're going to stab someone you're going to you know, stick pencils up your nose and run around the street and kill people. Yeah. Get Doesn't sacked mean from work. Or they're the things that people... Any you know, of that. Missy's going to leave you. And to oh, a, you're you're going to fly off the handle with yes. the kids. They're the real things, yeah. aren't to they? To an that? extent, exactly the same argument happens with alcohol. Um, and, and that people worry about the, 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 the idea that you're powerless, okay? And it's not that you're powerless. Do you know how successful AA is? AA is the most prescribed treatment around the world, right, for alcohol problems, okay, and and for narcotics and and for sex addicts, anonymous, okay. Apparently that exists. I don't, uh, someone told me. Um, but the most prescribed treatment for alcohol is AA, okay. Universally, it's your first port of call, right? And if you can't do it as an outpatient, you can go to rehab, right? Do you know the success rate for AA universally around the world? What do you reckon? Hmm. 
As in, as in, you, you get on, that. Tobe, do you, yeah. What do you reckon? You get that. You're not googling this, Tobe, are you? You're not googling it while we're. You get the person off the booth the and they the don't go back to it. No, they never go back to it. Or, 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 or they might go back to it occasionally. Yeah, just, just tell us. No, I'm gonna. No, let's guess go it. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna say fifty percent. I'm gonna straight down the middle. The most oh, prescribed so treatment anywhere in the world. Yeah. Forty percent. Forty percent. Fifty. I know what it is, so I'm not gonna. What is it? Six percent, isn't it? About six, seven, seven and a half percent, and 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 like the number of people in some of these crazy cults, right? You can't actually find out the exact thing because the results are never produced, right? Mm. So you're talking as low as six or seven percent, and as you quite mental. rightly say, the other ninety-three percent then come out the other side feeling they're a failed human being, feeling they're not good enough, believing in this higher Rebounding power. Rebounding massively, worse than ever before. Yeah, believing I'm a terrible person, that your friends are going to leave you, their family are going to disown you, blah, 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 blah. I, I just think that's unhelpful. Yeah. That's all. I think it's un unhelpful. And the idea about addiction, I know it's going to add a minute to this conversation, right, but do you know where the whole argument from smoking being addictive came from? It was one single experiment done in America, and I think someone will have to google this after in the 60s right one experiment was done with rats okay and basically it, 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 the, the the results were given to the public of um it's proven rats prefer alcohol to uh, to nicotine to non-nicotine solution therefore smoking is addictive right sorry is the um i've got it here is it called rat park R rat park is the follow-up to it right apologies it, no that's all right yeah, yeah. but it is part of it right um and and if i tell you that right dan it's been proven mate Rats prefer nicotine to glucose solution or saline solution. Therefore, it's addictive. You go, oh, fair enough, I'm addicted. But when you spend 30 seconds looking into the experiment, right, for a start, it was a very small uh, box that the rats were in, right? All male rats. Now, I don't know how much you know about rats. You know a lot about fish. Do you know much about rats? Nothing. Incredibly social creatures, okay? Take a rat out of its natural environment around female rats and baby rats and they go bonkers and they do all kinds of shit, weird shit, right? So now you've got only male rats in a small cage, no little wheel to jump around on or anything else, and what they failed to, uh, to tell you at the beginning is they fed all of these rats for a month prior on the nicotine solution. Now put them in a cage, surprise, surprise, they all go for nicotine. Years later... Uh, uh, better researchers created this thing called Rat Park where they created a massive cage with majestic rolling hills and women rats and baby rats and you know flower beds and lovely food blah blah none of them went for nicotine but the whole of this belief for the last 40 years which has been own, owned by the medical profession was based on the Surgeon General of the States came out and said smoking's addictive we proved it in this experiment it was all based on that Mm. That is great. <laughs> I mean, bollocks. How many people have died? Five million uh, a year. Uh, yeah, exactly. Off the back of that, yeah. that that starting a belief. Yeah. Crazy, isn't it? And, and so, I, I, I can't. I, I, I don't, if I'm sounding bitter towards these things, I, I, I'm not, right? Because you know, it, it, if if you knew what you were saying to your kids, right, you'd never say it, would you? You're an enlightened parent now, aren't you? Yes. And you're careful and cautious about what you say because you know everything you say is building a set of beliefs which are going to have a massive impact not just on your daughter's overall beliefs and attitude towards life but on her immune system as well, on her immune system hmm. because how much anxiety and stress you create directly affects your immune system, right? So if you're confident you don't create very much, you're going to have a better immune system. Hmm. So these things are massively important and I just think that we should have an awful lot more care on how we package these treatments and things and give them to people, um, bearing in mind how easy it is to affect how powerful or not a person. But the moment you say you're addicted to someone that's not feeling powerful, they're going to, what's, what's the point in trying? Mm. I'm addicted, what can I do? Mm. Yeah. yeah, of course. I watched my dad die of lung cancer from smoke, and watch him die, right? But he, I was there when he died, smoking a lung cancer, and he carried on smoking until he died because he was worried to, what's the point in trying to stop? I'm addicted. You hear that all the time. Yeah, yeah. and of course he wasn't. And actually had stopped plenty of times for various things, like a mm. rugby season a few years earlier and whatever. It's nothing to do with being powerless, okay? At most, 
he would have had a difficult few weeks. Most women that stop smoking when they're pregnant stop just like that. Mm. There's no, not been a single recorded case of a Hasidic Jew smoking during the Sabbath. Catholics find it easy to give up for Lent. Well, people uh, go on an aeroplane. They go on a plane flight, don't and they? And 12 they hours or 22 yeah. hours and don't smoke. Yeah. You've never seen anyone light up in Tesco's. And you've never met a single person that says, oh, I'm addicted to smoking. I have to get up every hour on the hour to have a cigarette. They sleep like babies. Mm. <laughs> you say, what? So what you're you're, you're only so addicted true. during the daytime then, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's just nonsense. I understand, I, understand, true, I understand why it was explained that way. I understand why it's said to people with PTSD, you've got these memories that keep coming up and blah, 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 blah. I understand why, because it, it's a good way of explaining it. But if you thought for one minute about how powerless you were making that person, I don't think you'd describe it that way again. Yeah. It's my belief. Yeah. I've just got to say, Rob, I'm going to be totally 100% honest with you. <laughs> In our break, as you guys left, I, th I was thinking, I even said to Simon, I said, I thought smoking was addictive because you mentioned it right at the beginning mm. of the show and I was going to ask you because I thought nicotine is an addictive substance. But, but you've totally obliterated no, no, that. No, 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 but no, no, no. But Smoke, but smoking, smoking is addictive, yes. okay? Yeah, it's yeah. what the word means it doesn't mean that you are going to die or go ape shit if you don't have another cigarette That's it. Yeah. it means your body's going to kick up a bit of fuss yeah even with heroin right there were 140,000 regular heroin units that came back from vietnam that went straight back into normal society without coming off it or without going to methadone or anything right like all of these things like smoking and drugs and food that you wanted to talk about, okay? It's situational. People do these things mm. to deal with the stresses and pressures of life when yeah. they don't have other ways of dealing with it. People get addicted to habits, don't they? They're actually addicted to the habit itself, yeah. rather than... Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would always do that stupid thing when people say addiction, right? Because I wouldn't even say the word now. He will never say good luck <laughs> to anyone again. Has he done that with you yet? No, I, I, in fishing, I say tight lines, which is sort of good. But when people go to me, good luck, I'm like, mate, it's not luck. You've either put it in the right place or the wrong place. It's either the right hook bait or the wrong hook bait. There's no such thing. And they sort of look at me and sort of shake their head and... You know, don't you um, think it's but, good but, to always like, um, you know, like you buy a lottery ticket and the, you know, the, the chance of luck. I mean, I've never bought a lottery ticket, but I mean, for a lot of people, it's just luck can give them. I don't know. It's exciting, you know, to think that, that luck. It's it, yeah, it's exciting, Kate. But you you got twenty million depressed people in the UK every Friday at eight o'clock when they didn't win. Yeah, yeah, and, they, and there are, I mean, and there are five are down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, think about it this way, right? How how many times would you have to be rude to someone. How many times would I have to tell Dan before he's thriving us, right? That's boring us all, by the way, right? <laughs> before the, his, his change, right? How many times would you have to say to someone something like, God, you're looking old or you're looking a bit fat before it affected them? Two or three times? Yeah, not many. Okay. A lot so, of people, one time. So if, you, yeah. if, you, if, you're, if you're living your life hoping and expecting luck is i'm gonna someone's gonna give me that job i'm gonna find the money i'm you know i'm gonna I'm win the lottery I, I, I took a client through <laughs> thrive recently uh, uh, who's christian and and she was 35 never had a relationship and she said I, i'm waiting i'm waiting for god to provide him i said well you could put a bit of effort in yourself <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know and, and actually at least go looking or or, or make yourself available you know if, if you're only <laughs> waiting for him to provide it right you, you know you might have a long wait Mm. You know, so that the, there is no such thing as luck, and, and uh, you know there is good fortune. There's being in the right place at the right time. There's knowing the right people, but if you it, people that are powerless want to believe in luck because they don't think it's going to happen they out of their skill set. Yeah. Yeah. Can't yeah. do it themselves. Yeah, mm. I, the I, I think I rely on luck playing golf at the moment. That I'm going to hit a dodgy yeah. tee shot. It's going to ricochet what? off the wall behind and then bounce. Because that's or just say, you're thinking about it yeah. so much, Simon, rather than just doing it, you know. <laughs> or just and, say and patting yourself um, on the back when you do do it well. Yeah, which you probably don't do. No, not very often. No. Well, that's the I other. Don't do it well that's enough. the other point because there is some there is some niceness about hope. I get I get but what you're saying. There, there is. Okay. There, but there, actually, there. when you when you hit the ball well, right? If you think it was luck, yeah. how are you ever going to get better? Mm. Well, no, I don't think it's always luck, but there are elements of luck. I mean, if a, if I hit a tee shot and it bounces off something, bounces around the green and then goes into the hole, that's luck, isn't it? Yeah, but you don't gain anything. You're not, you're not pleased about that, are you? Don't know if it you, goes in. You don't, right. you don't, you, you <laughs> don't get to hold in one. You don't mind. <laughs> you, you don't. I mean, if you if you went if you went to a lake and there was a fish there on someone's hook and you put it in a net, you wouldn't go, yeah, I've caught a fish, would you? No, no. Well, it's the luck thing is like. 
people say oh, I went in that swim because it was the last one available and I caught this fish and that was luck and what have you but you still put the right bait in the right spot in that swim you know and it, yes it, it was good fortune that that fish came round you know into that swim but you still did everything else right you didn't just sit in the swim on your ass and one jumped out in your yeah. lap and you had a picture <laughs> yeah. of it. Yeah. You didn't. You did all the other things right. You and did you everything should, you, should you could do. You congratulate yourself. Yeah. You everything know, you could do to make it more likely to, to happen. To make it more likely to happen, yeah. And that's what... And there's a lot more pleasure and a lot more great feeling in knowing that you have done it yourself rather than it was just landed in your lap. Of course. There is, mm. you know. And if you know that about every single thing that you do in life... That's a great way to go through life and think I'm in control of this and everything I'm doing is what's improving my life and every you know that's a far far better way than waiting for something to fall upon yeah. you and then it just never does and you feel shit all the time because it doesn't. There's a large body know? of research that says also that people who believe in luck put less effort in. So, they for example, do. in relationships, if you believe that if you believe that love is magic or chemistry or something and your relationship goes peak tong, you put less effort in than someone that believes a relationship is about hard work and trying new things and putting effort in and looking at things differently. They will, you know, if you feel powerful, like I can get this relationship with Dan back on track, you're going to put more effort in. But if you think that Dan loving you was just luck and he doesn't love you anymore, what am I going to do? Mm. Mm. Nice way to end the show. We haven't done our gifts. <gasps> Have we got gifts? Well, yes. Uh, Rob, Look, have you got a nice oh, gift for us? What? Do you not recognise that? I do, I think yeah, everybody yeah. everybody will recognise yeah, it was, that. Um, yeah. Yeah, it I can like only get one. You washed it? That They washed it out <laughs> for me. There's a little bit of Danny DNA still in the bottom, which Damien and the boys said they're going to clone me from. <laughs> <laughs> so if I don't actually live that long, it Lots doesn't matter to Porter at all. <laughs> they can just have another one and another one. You remember that boys from Brazil? Yeah. Have you seen yeah. that film? That's a brilliant film, isn't it? Great film. That but is. Pele that was that in Laur- that, Laurent, Lawrence Olivier. Pele was in that, wasn't he? Lawrence, was it Lawrence and Olivier? And the two dogs. What was the dogs? Um, at Cut and Action. Yes. No. W- Rosebud. No. Wasn't it Rosebud? The dogs no, attacked. The, no, he said cut. Well, he said action, and they attacked. Oh, that's right. And he said cut, okay. and I don't know what the names were, but he was obviously he was one of the cloned Hitlers, yes. wasn't he, yep. the boy? But it was Gregory Peck. That's right. And Lawrence Olivier, wasn't it? Lawrence oh. Olivier was the goody, and Gregory Peck was, the, Gregory was the baddie. Peck. You know that what an amazing. If you haven't seen that film, ladies and gents, watch that film. That is an amazing film. I'm but, still laughing because so, I can actually imagine my dad going, Dan. Don't worry what happens, don't mate. We're no, just going to make another one of you. Then. <laughs> yeah. It's called the salted. Don't worry about it. So, so, so anyway, so this is the bottle from your, from one your of, drain one last of, week. One which... of the bottles that I, I was draining into from last time. The second one, the nurse wouldn't let me have it because <laughs> she said she couldn't drain it away because there was nowhere because of disease control or infection control or something. And she wouldn't give it to me because she didn't know where I was going to drain it to. So I only got one but I'm giving that one to you. And then when eventually Wendy pulls her finger out and I does know. these... does I've, these, I've been on her, mate. Does, you it? have? Yeah, I have, honestly. Don't say, that sounds so weird. <laughs> no, no. That sounds so weird, so that's, that's like... I mean, that's I, like I've your mum. <laughs> that's like your second mum. I've been on her. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Wonderful. On, on at her toe. On at, asking her very politely. Asking her very politely. Where where are these glass cabinets? <laughs> she's going to cringe now. Isn't yeah, she? she's going to pop a will. cringe. Yeah. So, but but, but, but might, that can have a little plaque in front of it, it and that will yeah. continue to remind people about the about respecting the sun. Can we get a plaque that says more. "Don't be a prick"? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. With your I'm glasses like. sitting it, over yeah. the top of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <that's> it. <laughs> Rob, what have we got there? Well, listen, I only knew about the whole gift thing about 7 o'clock last night, right? So I, I've been through all my cupboards. These are Thrive bracelets, look. And I will send you 100, okay? I took one off as I gave it to one of the kids at the pub yesterday, right? So I, I'm never without one of these. Yeah, I saw you were. Constant yeah. reminder. Some of them glow in the dark. I think this batch... Oh, awesome. Don't. Yeah. Okay? I only found <laughs> one of these. This is a Thrive bottle opener. I'm not suggesting people should drink, can open, right? But it also is a phone holder. Mm. This is for you, Sam. This is a lovely, I've only had one of these right. left. This is a lovely Thrive bracelet. It's got Thrive written on it. Look. And got one of those for you. Thank you very much. That's for you, that's for you. And then right. this is for you, Daniel. I don't know why I'm saying Daniel today. I've got a mate. <laughs> I'm, I'm only saying that because there's a mate at the pub uh, who, who was working away and he came back on, on the weekend to see his wife. And he, and and he had to isolate, 
So he came back and looking forward to seeing his wife, seeing all his friends, coming down the pub. I don't spend my life at the pub, by the way. Uh, and um, he's now got to isolate for, for, for 10 days. Right. Okay, so everyone's feeling sorry for him. This, I don't know why we wrapped it. This, that's an original Thrive book, right? When no, I, I first, now. yeah, yeah, I first. There's not a lot of point in wrapping it up if you're going to no, tell me what it is before. <laughs> I know. So don't, 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 but it's interesting, right? Because this the, is the like, first time. That, oh, wow! <laughs> it's an original <laughs> Thrive book. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Rub your finger on the front, look. I had that embossed with the, that word. There. That wow. sounded so genuine. That Dan, yeah, well. that you. was great. Yeah. Thank you. So the interesting thing about that, right? Other than I only ever had two thousand made, right. is because immediately after that we stopped doing that, and they're all spiral bound now. So it wasn't until I'd done the first ones that I realised. Look, every few weeks I'm going to want to update it. Yeah. So we've never made them since. There's a finite number of those. Ever is, there, is, there, is there more in this one than that one then? Bro? That's much more up to date. Yeah. Is it right? Okay. Yeah, and it's yeah. spiral bound, so we can change so. it on a weekly basis. That's just yeah. we only had two thousand of those made in the first. I got about four left. Wow. Thank you, mate. Wow. They'll never can be you like sign that it again. For me? It's worth even less if I sign no, it. No, come on, sign it for me. Right. You must Actually, have a you can pen. sign this one so, as well. Aim a pen, my, pen over here, mate. Oh, how about there we that? Go. Lovely. So, that um, so that was, sign I didn't, away. I there, couldn't Rob. even see that. That's that was it. Just, that was there were so many that. blacks and that. It just <laughs> boom. Share your story. Mm. It's the first time that a, 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 someone on the show has actually received a gift. Then, yeah, this is a, this is a first, isn't yeah, it? He just he just did it for effect, didn't he? <laughs> it works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't yeah. have anything else, on, honestly. On, on the <laughs> job to write like, in oh, a proper pen. Now yeah. he's done that. Now he's now he's done that. It's like oh, I was going to ask for that back on the way home. Now he's <laughs> put Dan in it. He's, <laughs> he's Damn massively it. cut down the amount of people you can give that to as well. Now, isn't it? So I actually brought that for somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Have I got to think of something witty to say in this book? It, no, it's not it's at entirely all. up not to you, Rob. But it's um, get on with it. <laughs> to Simon, get on with it. Well, that barbecue is um, waiting, isn't it? Yeah, I, I'm going to be barbecuing under an umbrella, I think, tonight. What's going on it? Yeah, I've uh, got to work hard. Well, we've got, we've got sea bass. Try to. Thanks. Sea bass, and we've got steak. Lovely. We've got some nice homemade salads that I'm going to do as well. Greek salad, you into Greek salad? <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's um, tahini dressing. Do you Lovely. Like that? Oh, on on, on uh, nice. spinach. Yeah, yeah. Mm. That's my wife's specialty. I'd just like to and tell yeah. our entire audience, me and Simon weren't invited. No, we're not invited. <laughs> no, absolutely not. <laughs> what no do you mean, way absolutely I'm, not? No. no another time. Another yeah, time. Maybe. Absolutely. I'd another time to, when I'd it's love not, to, when it's not to snake you and You can talk, tell us about being on Wendy. Oh, for, uh, <laughs> Damo's not going to like, like that. Like the actual oh, real, no. the real, the real story. <laughs> okay, oh, guys. Sorry, Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, Rob, thanks very much for coming on the Thank show. You very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Cheers, mate. The Thinking Tackle.